And welcome back again to another episode of yours. Yes, you, your favorite true crime and criminal culture podcast, Thought Right Podcast. My name's Brendan. And I am Malia. Welcome to the show. We're yes. Back at it again. We are. We are back at it with another episode just for you and only you, the one listening. The one who has my annoying voice in their ears right now. This one's for you. I feel like a radio talk show host. This song's for you. All right. Well, we commit to being honest, intelligent, unscripted, 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 and interesting conversations, bringing information we get and following it to wherever it leads, holding nothing back and sharing brutal honesty the entire time because we censor nothing and talk about everything. <laughs> talk about everything. All right. So tonight should uh, be a really good show. I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, I intentionally tried to reduce the amount of bullet points that I brought with me. Um, so, uh, you know, we always commit to an unscripted show. And and for the most part, really, we do keep it unscripted. We have no idea what we're going to be talking about. Really, we only bring bullet points so we can remember like certain names, dates, places, things like that. The things that are the hardest to remember, you know, for someone that doesn't have a photogenic memory or something like that. So this show should be a really, really good one, and it should provide us some really good openers for the True Crime Talk Show, which we do every Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, anywhere. So our premieres start at 8.15, 8.30, right around that time. We always let people know at least a couple hours ahead of time. Um, and as soon as that premiere ends, we dive right into the true crime talk show, talking specifically about the premiered video, covering anything that we might have missed tonight during recording and uh, talking about the topics that the chat is highlighting. So, you know, the chat's watching along and talking along with us. Um, and if they throw something out there and, and like it shows a lot of interest, we'll we'll end up talking about it on there um, and diving into that, too. So. If you get a chance, come check it out and hop on there and join in the conversation. But uh, I think tonight's episodes, especially around the Idaho 4 and the people that are the most interested in the Idaho 4 case right now, are going to be a pretty big deal. We'll see. You guys let us yeah. know how you feel about it at the end. Yeah. Well, I mean, two of the topics are because of the community. so. Um, and they're very open ended. We're going to be going over some just real basic coverage of it, and then we will fill in the in between. So, uh, just make sure you guys continue supporting us like you have been doing, nothing additional, just everything you have been doing. Our growth has been absolutely incredible, and it's been all because of you guys, because all of you are amazing, all of you bring really the bulk of the show to us and give us the topics to talk about and the details to bring up. Um, you know, we are on Discord, Twitter, TikTok, Patreon, uh, Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, Spotify. We are on everything. And there is no requirement to join any of those. They are all free. Some of them offer paid tiers. If you're the type of person and you're in a position where you can financially support, that is incredible and we appreciate you. But it is not a requirement. You do not have to pay anything to be a thought writer. So make sure you hop on there on any of them. We were we are forward slash thought riot podcast, uh, except for Twitter, aka X. We are forward slash thought riot pod. Yes. Now with the intro out of the way. Yeah. Let's get into some breaking news. Yes. Let's. So we have two documents that we're gonna read through. Um you going to start with the first one? Um, yes, I can. I just want to make sure I do them in order. All right. So for number one here, we have filed on 229 of 24. 
Uh, and of course, we are covering the main case that we're covering right now is the Idaho 4 case uh, with the trial um, with the defendant, Brian Koberger, against the versus the state of Idaho, right? So this is state of Idaho versus Brian C. Koberger. Amended order for disclosure of IgG information and protection order. Based on the February 28, 2024 hearing, the sealed order for disclosure of IgG information and protection order is amended as follows. Defense counsel Ann Taylor, Jay Logston, and Alyssa Masseth, defendant Brian Koberger, and IgG defense experts Dr. Leah Larkin, Bicca Barlow, and Stephen Mercer may view the IgG materials provided by the state. Any further dissemination of the materials or the information contained within the materials, including to any investigators, must first be approved by the court after showing after a showing by the defense as to why such individuals needs the information for the preparation of the defense. Additionally, no individual on the family tree who was not previously known to the defense via the defense's own investigation may be contacted by the defense or any agent of the defense without prior authorization from the court. After a showing as to why such contact is necessary and material to the preparation of the defense. The defense's mitigation expert who has created her own family tree and who does not have access to any of the IgG information may continue her mitigation investigation, including contacting the defendant's immediate family members and other related individuals. The This is ordered the 29th of February, 2024. Signed, Judge John Judge. Now, I'm super confused here, you guys, and I'm going to put a foot in my mouth here, I'm sure, because as I'm going to be editing this video and we're going to be editing it, um, I'm probably going to cut in a clip here. But based off memory, I remember Judge John Judge saying, let's get your investigators the IgG information we can. I remember there was some holdback as to like, the details of the family tree and those investigators. But I remember them saying in court that your investigators can have access to the document that was submitted by the prosecution. Am I losing my mind here? So what was said is that the investigators could have access to the TUI letter, um, but not the IgG information. Um, he said, let's let your experts, meaning Steve Mercer, Bicca Barlow, and Leah Larkin, uh, take a look at it and then go from there. Okay. Okay. And then I believe I he's have... going to want the investigators to be named. Yes. Okay. Um, that makes more sense because... Uh... That's what I got from it anyway. Yeah, yeah. This just doesn't specify that in here. So it's a little bit confusing. So they got the experts, the IgG information, uh, but they are not currently allowing the private investigative team that Ann Taylor has employed. And what's interesting here, which, you know, this could just be a court thing, right? Because you, you're sharing private information of people um, with random other people. The court doesn't know this investigative team. Um, but uh, I think with a little bit of investigating into the, these investigators, they would see that, you know, they're professionals because they are known nationally as one of the best investigative teams that are out there that the defense has. And they specifically focus on and work directly with uh, with attorneys who hire them to investigate cases, you know, so they're, they're, uh, reliable, responsible, and they understand the, the importance of keeping these documents private. You know, I wouldn't consider them random people, but I also understand how the court looks at this and they're random people until stated otherwise, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I agree with you. Um, I think one of the issues here, other than what you're talking about is not wanting to put out this private information of people to anybody. It's not just about them being like professionals. Um, it's, we want as little eyes on those people as possible. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we won't, don't want their name thrown out there if it doesn't need to be. 
um, to anybody. One thing that I saw um, recently online, I don't remember who said this, but somebody said, is the mitigation expert like Gabriel Vargas? No. Just because she's building a family tree, the meaning the mitigation expert, does not mean she has anything to do with IgG. Her work is not IgG whatsoever. Mm-mm. She may like look into records, okay, similar to an IgG expert, but she's not doing any of it based off of DNA whatsoever. Um, this is all about which last week we talked about the mitigation phase and what that is. Um, so I, I recommend that. But mitigation basically starts if Brian Kober is convicted um, and is awaiting sentencing and mitigating factors, which is what the mitigation expert is trying to find, would be things that would they would try to find to argue to say, hey, you should go lighter on him and maybe not give him the death penalty or you know what I mean? Yeah, the mid- it, it sounds like to me, just based off the quick search I did, uh, breaking down the definition of the mitigation um, is uh is it something completely separate from the trial, like you're saying? Where it's, it's it after wants, the trial. Yeah, it's post conviction, um, and it sounds like it, it. It's one of those requirements that we heard from Ann Taylor talking about uh, a capital or death penalty case that uh, you know you got to go three, three generations history, or back. generations back, and uh, yeah. yeah. We- we talked about this last week, though, um, and it was helpful learning some about what mitigation is because I didn't completely understand that term um, until I looked into it, like what all it entails. Yes, yes, yes. But this is interesting. Um, I don't feel like there's anything crazy, wild or new that is coming out of this. It's kind of the same thing that we expected there's nothing real juicy coming out of this no Uh, but i just really wish they would be like okay give us your investigators names um and we'll get them the igg information like i don't see why it's got to be such a big thing just give it over you know i mean i'm right there with you I think what's more important is how they manage it and what they do with it so i think a a more streamlined response that the judge could have gave is look, I'm, I'm entrusting you with this information here. And if you say that your investigators need it, then I'm going to trust that they need it. And if something fails and something happens, understand you're going to be held responsible for that something. So, uh, you know, keep it under lock and key, whatever, whatever, so that we don't have a Delphi situation with, pictures right hopefully i mean that whole delphi situation i don't want to get into it but it feels like you know that that was done in a very shady way with a very specific intention like why would you hey best friend let's let me break into your office and snap a couple pictures of your files that are under lock and key so you know what i mean yeah but anyway so i understand the importance of the judge managing it in this way yes i understand the importance of it but let us know let us know let us know so the next document we have here is state of idaho versus brian c koberger um it was filed on 3 6 24 and it is the motion requesting additional deadlines Comes now Brian C. Koberger by and through his attorneys and hereby requests this court for additional deadlines. The court's current order setting deadlines governs deadlines for additional alibi disclosures, change of venue motion briefing, witness lists, and evidence for both sides for the change of venue motion, state's discovery, and defense discovery. Mr. Koberger respectfully requests the court set additional deadlines. One. Expert disclosures, including required filings under Idaho Criminal Rule 16 and Idaho Rules of Evidence 702, 703, and 705. A. State, October 2024. B. Defense, January 2025. C. 
both sides all further disclosures, including rebuttal, March 2025. Two, defense motions regarding the death penalty. A, filed by November 2024. B, response by December 2024. C, hearing in January 2025. Three, motions and in quotation, or not quotes, parentheses, 12B, A, filed by January 2025, B, response by February 2025, C, hearing March slash April 2025. Four, motions in limine, A, filed by March 2025, B, responses by April 2025, C, hearing May 2025. Five, exhibits A, by March 2025, B, challenges, April 2025. Council requests the current order for mitigation discovery be extended to March 2025. Council respectfully makes this request to establish deadlines that will keep Mr. Koberger's case moving forward and allow for his defense team to be prepared. Dated this sixth day of March 2024, signed Ann C. Taylor, public defender. I, I want to throw something in there real quick before we even talk about this document because I can already I can see the future right now. I can already see somebody commenting about uh, the statement that I or you just made in the previous uh, document release, which hopefully will release the day before this since this came out after that. Um, but for anyone else watching the long form show, uh, just because there's a mitigation expert that is there to... Uh, research into, you know, reducing the potential accountability or charges if he ends up being found guilty. That is, that does not mean he's guilty. That is a requirement for the capital death penalty case. I want to make sure everyone's very clear on that because we talked about it last week and uh, we, I can already see somebody commenting saying, well, why would they have uh, a mitigation expert if he's innocent, right? And they have to. It is a requirement. They don't have a choice. Yeah, this is this happens in every trial. Yeah. Every capital trial that, you know, life or the death penalty is on the line. Yep. Yep. It, it's in the rules that Malia was reading last week for anyone that didn't see it. It is a requirement. They gotta have all their ducks in a row. Mm-hmm. They plan for everything. Before they even know if he's found guilty or not. So, uh, but you know what's interesting with this document here is the fact that they they these are very loose dates, very loose dates. They don't even have dates on it, like the day. Okay, it is just the month and the year, which I think anybody with well, any experience because it's, it's not court, from the judge. It's Ann Taylor giving a suggestion. Around this month, this year is when I want these deadlines. And then John Judge will have to rule and set an actual date. Yeah, I, I understand that. I understand that. But the big difference between that and uh, the prosecution who is giving very firm dates is that I think the defense has a very, very, very big job ahead of them. And uh, I, I think this proves that you know they're they're setting themselves up for some wiggle room and and again i could see people watching this and thinking yeah that's because ann taylor is trying to push the dates and everything else but let's be real here neither side is ready so i think both sides honestly were pushing the timeline uh you know we had people who commented on some of the videos who were like the the state is ready to go. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Just stop. They're ready to go right now. They were ready to go last summer. What the state literally said they weren't ready. <laughs> I know. Just listen I to know. them talk. You know, it was also a thing where, and I have seen numerous creators and numerous people comment and talk about this online, that Ann Taylor admitted there is footage of Brian Koberger's car. She didn't. No, she didn't. But, I mean, that's really twisting her words, like, a lot, you guys. And I don't think that's very good faith um, at all. And I, I don't agree with that. Like, I don't agree with doing that. She, That's twisting her words entirely. However, even if she did admit there's footage of Brian Koberger's car, 
she wasn't talking about the crime scene. At no point did she talk about the crime scene. Almost certainly, if they're saying Brian Koberger was driving around that night as his alibi, there's footage of his car. What? Wait. Nobody is saying. He, wait. Creators have came out and, and tried to argue like, oh my gosh, Ann Taylor admitted Literally there's admitted there's car. footage of his car at it's in the, the PCA. crime scene. It's in the PCA. At the crime scene. They're saying she just admitted there's footage of his car at the crime scene. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't know. Each each creator is their own, okay? It's not for me to judge whatever they're covering. Um, But that that isn't objectively what was said in court. What was said in court is that, one, Ann Taylor doesn't have any footage that shows Brian Koberger's car but she's waiting on the second half of this footage that she believes the state is going to rely very heavily upon in this case that is what was said so she confirms that the state said there's images or video of his car that she does not have it or has not seen it to clarify yeah she essentially said she didn't have any footage of his car yeah yeah so, but it was literally she the did opposite say that the state is claiming and, and leaning on that footage in the same breath. So, yeah, but she said she wasn't talking about any footage of the car at the same time. So I don't know. I think that she switched topics very quickly on intentionally because um, she didn't want to get into it. Um, you know, it's covered by a gag order. Um, but I just want to say that even if. There's footage of his car, which it says in the PCA there is. His alibi is he was driving around. Why is that such a big deal that there's footage of his car? And she also wasn't talking about the crime scene. Like, we got to wait till trial. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to try to make claims like that. uh, Before trial. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's very fair, to be honest. Um. I, I just know that the only the only evidence we have uh, is really what is in the court documents and or what has been said in court. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the only thing that's going to support any claims that are said in court is the evidence that we're going to be able to see at trial. So, um, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Anyway, but, um, these deadlines, I mean, you're, yeah, they're pretty loose. She's not requesting specific dates. Um, but I want to know what you guys think about the deadlines. Um, if, cause I know, I know several people actually that like to line up dates. Um, and I, I've seen, I've seen some interesting stuff with it. Well, it, w- one thing that people need to remember too that when they're lining these dates up uh it it is a plan of action and plan of actions are meant to be moldable and change based on the needs and the circumstance of the situation um so uh even when you're listening to this and reading this this is not a promise to be very clear to everyone this is not a promise that this is when things are going to be done. This is me. This just means this is when they're shooting well, for them to that, be done. This is what Ann Taylor is requesting from the judge. To be fair, it's it is not stating these are the deadlines. This is what she's requesting. Um, and since this is the these are the dates that she's requesting, I'm curious. Can any of you read the tea leaves and try to figure anything out? Because sometimes you can. And let me know what you think. Yeah. So I have one update um, or one news story that I wanted to bring for this episode because it struck me the other day. As soon as I saw it pop up on the news. Oh, actually, it was um, Twitter. The Occult Rejects posted it on Twitter. Oh, we love the occult rejects. Yes. And I I couldn't. So immediately, I just had this feeling. Okay, so here's the title. Six dead, including four children, in Ottawa mass killing. 
And the fact that it said mass killing and not shooting made me think, is it a knife? And I just had a feeling. So I went looking into it and it is indeed, and it is horrific. You guys, um, It is essentially a whole family, and the only one that survived was the father. Um, this includes the mother and her four young children, including a two-month-old baby. Just absolutely horrible. They um, had just immigrated to Canada um, from... How do you say that country? Do you know how to say that country? What? Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka? Okay. Yep. So there is the 35-year-old mother, a 7-year-old, a 4-year-old, a 3-year-old, and a 2-month-old, like I said. Um, there. So who is being charged in this case is somebody who was living with them. Oh, and I'm sorry. It was, another man had passed, actually, too. It was a 40-year-old man who was staying with them. So... And the father survived. Well, the 40-year-old man that was staying with them was not related to them, I don't believe. And the 19-year-old who's accused of this crime was also staying with them. Um, his name is Fabrio Dezoisa. De De um, he's charged with six counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Um he is a student and had also just immigrated there. So this is like a whole house full of immigrants. Um, and we don't know why he did this. Like a whole family, like babies. Yeah, sounds um, awful. There's, you know, the neighborhood has come together and, and you know, done a vigil. And there was a Buddhist, um, a monk, that they were going to a Buddhist temple, this family, and they would go there to help out. And he said they were really helpful, like innocent people. Like they didn't deserve this at all. You know, yeah. they were super, super nice. And it sounds like they, you know, anytime they had only been there like a year, not even a full year yet. Sounds awful. But a knife. I don't know what type of knife. Um, I have no idea about that yet. They're, they're literally just saying an edged weapon right now. But the father is in the hospital. Um, he had a finger, like, basically severed. Um, and I just can't imagine what he's going through right now, you know? Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to bring it up. Um, because, you know, we, we usually keep tabs on stabbing cases like this now. Um, and look for evidence. Look uh, how the forensics ends up playing out. Um, and obviously I want justice for this family. And following the case helps with that. So I just wanted to bring attention to it. We'll follow it as there's updates on it. Or if there's something we feel we need to look into. Um, but other than that, that's it. Yeah, let us know. And that is it for the breaking news updates of the week, case updates of the week, and on to the stories. I got to be honest with you guys. This week, we are a little more heavy on the Idaho 4, which I swear our viewers love right now. I think everyone's obsessed with the Idaho 4 case. Uh, there's just so many questions. There was a recent hearing recently. Uh, and, uh, there's just a lot going on in it and a lot of unanswered questions. And you know, what's interesting is I, I bet if they took off the gag order, I bet interest would drop. Well, maybe it would increase for a minute, but I bet it would drop really quick. Once everybody got the answers, um, and there, yeah, I think a lot of interest would drop. Not all of it. I mean, to this day, people still are interested in the Watts case um, and many other cases that, you know, gripped the nation at one time. But like with how much coverage this case gets, um, yeah, that would, I think, significantly drop. 
I agree. Yeah. I agree. All right. So I guess we will start with the most important cases for our viewers, right? For our viewers. I think every case is equally important when there's a victim. Um, but uh, the, the interest of the community and, and why I'm saying that is because I put out a, uh, a poll last week and I asked, what was it exactly? I said, uh, we have intentionally refrained from covering certain topics in the Idaho Force sphere for a multitude of reasons. What theory, topic, idea, speculation would you like to hear us cover most in relation to the Idaho 4 case? Now, as you guys can see here on the screen, uh, Brent Kopaka was number one. And... Uh, it's not that surprising. We have intentionally refrained from that for a while. Um, but uh, we're going to be talking about Brent Kopaka, Jack Showalter, and uh, getting into it from there. So uh, how are we starting tonight? Are we starting with one of my cases, or would you like to start? You can start with yours. All right. So let's get into... Idaho for Brent Kopaka. Now, my my, I this is one of the topics where I intentionally didn't bring a lot of details. I have enough to walk everyone through it, right? Because we have so many international viewers. We had like literally like ninety percent of our viewers are international. I, I swear. Um, we have so many people that come to YouTube. That have come to this chat right here, right here. Wait, is it? No, over here, over here on this side of the screen, this chat right over here. Uh, because of Thought Riot Podcast, I, I still to this day get a ton of comments where they're like, you know, I was never big on YouTube before, but I started listening to you guys and then uh, I'm here now, you know, which is incredible, absolutely incredible. And and why I'm saying that, like why that's important here is because anybody that is on YouTube and has been on YouTube for a long time, uh, more than likely is part of the true crime rotation. There are some big true crime creators out there that follow a lot of the mainstream topics and put out a bunch of videos on these topics. And uh, if you're on YouTube, more than likely you've seen some of these, right? But a lot of our viewers that are coming to YouTube for Thought Riot Podcast uh, do, do, don't do watch a lot of these other creators. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they aren't getting the same information like in this situation with Brent Kopaka as a lot of viewers. And, you know, Ian... Ha has been asking us to cover this for a long time. Really? A long time. Yeah. All right. So who is Brett Kopaka and why is he interesting in the Idaho 4 case? Okay. So the Idaho 4 case where uh, we have the victims, uh, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, Ethan Chapin, Kaylee Gonsalves, and currently have uh, Brian Koberger, who is uh, charged by the state of Idaho in defending himself against the Idaho 4 massacre. Now, Brent Kopaka did not have any connections here, okay? And the the only way we're going to be able to dig into this is to look at it objectively, all right? And uh, the, the, the only way to objectively look at this is to give everyone the full rundown of the situation. Yes. It's, it's a... It's kind of a lot to understand, honestly, if you've never heard it before. It is. All right. So Brent Kopaka is a 36-year-old uh, ex-military. I, I don't know if you would say ex-military because I believe he was honorably discharged, which I, I didn't write that down here. Do you remember if he's honorably discharged? I know he had 
some issues. So I think it was honorable medical discharge, which in my opinion is super important. Do you remember? No, I don't okay. remember. Uh, I, it's just really important because it's one of the reasons why we've delayed talking about this for so long, you guys, because um, this is a military veteran who willingly put his life on the line to protect the U.S., to protect our interests. He ended up getting hurt in battle. He got the Purple Heart uh, while in combat. He was an airborne army uh, combat soldier, and uh, it, 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 always, it always gives me pause when I see someone that committed to our country in such a way to openly go down a potential rabbit hole around if they could be guilty of a crime with no objective evidence. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I do. Um, I just want to be very aware when we're talking about this, that we, we do not take this topic lightly. Uh, we think it, he deserves the absolute and utmost respect here. Um, but this again is one of those topics that we've made a commitment to our viewers that we will talk about absolutely everything, no matter what it is. And we're just going to do it in a respectful fashion. Right. So, uh, Brent Kopaka was 36 and, uh, he was fatally shot by the WSU police Sergeant Brent, Brett Boyd in Pullman, Washington, um, it was approximately 31 days after the Idaho 4 massacre. Now, it, when I'm trying to remember why this took hold in such a way that it did, um, I think it. I think if I'm looking back, right, where Brent Kopaka really started coming into the picture is on 12:15 is when this happened, okay? And the situation, you guys, th this is the overview, and then we're going to do other videos where we dig further into the evidence. We have a FOIA, we've already submitted, and we've got a ton of stuff sitting here. But just to get our viewers updated, um, on 12-15 of 2022, there was a call in, or police say there was a call in. That's one of the pieces of evidence that was that's in question, uh, saying that there was a hostage situation at the apartments that Brent Kopaka lived on. Now, remember, on twelve fifteen, that is before Brian Koberger. That is before anybody had ever been named as a suspect, which no one did in the Idaho Four case until Brian Koberger. Yeah, they didn't announce they had a suspect until he was already arrested. Right. Um, but yeah. It it makes me think that because at the entire world's eyes was on Idaho at this time, this situation happened, which already is uncommon in this area. They don't have a suspect, so people start automatically thinking and drawing connections like, oh, Maybe this has to do with the Idaho Four. Well, let's find out, right? And I think that's really where the interest interest started coming in. But you know what's interesting here is there's a lot of evidence that suggests some very big coincidences between uh, Brent Kopaka and Brian Koberger. There are some weird coincidences. There are some weird ones. Um, and we'll get into like the details of those when we go further in our other videos. But, uh, you know, just to give you a taste. So D Brian Koberger and Brent Kopaka lived within 15 minutes of each other in Pennsylvania and in Washington. That's one that sticks with me. That is very strange. Very, very, very strange. Because that is a very big coincidence Has to live on the East Coast, general, pretty much on the East Coast, 15 minutes away from somebody, and around the same time of moving, move all the way to the West Coast and randomly live 15 minutes away from somebody, but you don't know them? That's a strange one. 
I think when people heard that, they were like, that, that's a big coincidence. It is a really weird coincidence. Like, it, it is really odd. I mean, I don't know what it means, but. It's strange. It's, it is strange. Yeah, it's, it's strange. But um, at the same time, it's like, when you think about it, like, well, why would they do that, though? Like, yeah, it's a weird coincidence, but why would they live 15 minutes apart? Like, why would they, they're grown men, why would they follow each other, you know? Yeah. And pretend they don't know each other? Yeah, I, I don't. live separate lives, but live, like, 10, I don't know, away? and, and you know, on the night of the crime, um, they believe that Brian Koberger drove to Brent Kopaka's apartments. Who believes that? The community in general, the people that are interested in the Brent Kopaka story. So the theory is that Koberger drove that way? Yeah, that drove to Brent Kopaka's apartments. Brent Kopaka's parents also owned uh, a white Hyundai Elantra. So the Brent Kopaka story, you guys, to give you a, a rundown here, like I was saying with uh, being in the apartment and uh, it was um, a really horrible situation where we don't even know all of it. We have no idea, right? Even through the body cam, even through everything, there are certain aspects of the Brent Kopaka situation that nobody understands. Um, but there, according to police, was a 911 call that somebody placed. And uh, they and said it was a roommate. That's what they say. The cops. Yeah. Nothing can be confirmed. They won't release that 911 call. Um, but they they claim there's a 911 call that was a roommate. Um and uh, called in and said that they were, it was a hostage situation in their apartment. Well, he said, I mean, the roommate supposedly said, Brent Kopaka is trying to kill us. He's threatening to kill us, right? N no, I didn't hear that uh, from the interview where the police officer talks about the 911 call. I didn't hear that. And, and that's the big question is, Nobody knows what's on that 911 call. It won't be released. They're claiming they don't have it. So nobody knows. The How roommates, can they not have it? The roommates both claim they did not make that call. That's where the, all this question comes from. This is why people think that it could be some sort of setup because there is no connection of how they got to Brunt. Brent Kopaka's apartment. Hmm. So when, uh, however the police got there, which is already strange. Okay. At these apartments, um, there's a lot of body cam footage of the roommates talking to the police and the body cam footage. It, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like, they're afraid for their lives. Even though we were told that this was a hostage situation, there were no roommates in the apartment. Brent Kopaka was alone in the apartment by himself, okay? Police end up breaching after uh, shooting him dead. Um, and ultimately, through all of this, his phone was wiped clean and left on the counter table. Now, some other interesting aspects of this is when you look at hostage situations or holdup situations, uh, what police normally do is they'll reach out to a family member. They'll reach out to a friend. Uh, they'll try and get someone personal that has a connection with Brent Kopaka in this situation. Uh, but that didn't happen. Yeah. You mean during like when they're trying to deescalate. So, you so while they while he was in there in the apartment alone and they were like the cops are all outside the SWAT team was called and they you know were trying to talk him down or whatever um 
they should have had somebody like a de-escalation expert who gets in contact, like you said, with like a family member or a friend and have that person talk to them because they know that person. And that can sometimes like bring them back to reality or remember what matters or, you know, it can be really helpful. Yeah. Um, and that didn't happen. And no, it did happen. Well, it did. You're they, right. It, they called did, his friend, but... Darren Duncan, and said, hey, do you know Brent Kopaka? And he said, yeah, what's going on? And tried to understand. And she said, okay, well, something along the lines of we'll call you back, okay? Uh, they never call him back. They never try and get Brent Kopaka the phone. They never try and de-escalate the situation. Uh, the next thing that happens is they they you know, put a bullet through him. Which you don't even get to see on body cam. Like it's not on any officer's body cam. There's a lot of strange things on that body cam. However, we got to stay on point with, is this connected to the Idaho four? Right. Um, I think there was a major injustice done here when it comes to Brent Kopaka. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, it, a lot of things should have happened that didn't happen. I don't know why this area has such an issue with being open, with clear communication, letting the public in on what's going on. That 911 call should have been released like every other case in the entire U.S. Why it wasn't, I have no idea. Why was his phone wiped? I have no idea. Uh, why did... Brent Kopaka live within 15 minutes of Brian Koberger all the way across the United States. I have no idea. I don't know. A lot of people theorize, though, that when Brent Kopaka was talking, he, uh, the police or people that believe the current police story believe he was saying that, uh, something about his roommates, but people that believe there's a connection here with Brent Kopaka. And remember, I'm just trying to give everyone the basic rundown of the story. So then when we do the next video, we'll go into the deep, the details of the story. People who believe there's a connection here to the Idaho four believe Brent Kopaka was talking about the roommates. Idaho for roommates that he was making comments and suggestions that he knew something about the college roommates. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's also really like, you can't really hear him talk in the body cam either, at least from what I heard. No, you can't. You get no real verification, which I'm not trying to go down conspiracy hole here, okay? I When I watch the body cam, I feel like it looks like any other body cam. It looks fine, right? The police, I feel like, that are outside the door are doing what they should. They're very uh, consciously aware of where bullets could come from because according to what they all know, Brent Kopaka had a gun, okay? They yeah. need to be acting with safety of themselves for a suspect that has a gun. I understand that. I am not trying to call out all these police officers that were trying to do their job, okay? Um, my big question is the 911 call because, and, and this is, this is what's important, okay? We've seen people get killed over being swatted. Yep. It's a very serious situation when you've swatted people. I've unfortunately seen families get swatted where there were kids home and somebody online thought it was funny to do that. And for anybody watching us that doesn't know what swatted means, it's where you call where somebody, a, a, an online troll and a troll, you know, trying to cause harm with creators or uh, media people, whatever, they'll call 911 in that area and say, hey, there's somebody at this address that has a gun that is threatening on ending the, the rest of the people's lives that are in that area. What's police going to do? They're going to show up guns blazing, ready to go in. OK, and there were there have been multiple occasions where police had end up shooting people dead. 
and they didn't have a gun. There was nothing going on there. So did that happen in this situation? Was Brent Kopaka connected to the Idaho four case in some way with Brian Koberger in some way? And this was some kind of cleanup. I think these are the questions the community is asking. And I think it's going to be up to us to look through the evidence and try and figure out if there's anything objectively to connect here. Because look, I don't believe what happened to Brent Kopaka was okay. I think that mistakes were made. I think that uh, in situations where we're dealing with uh, ex-military and the police knew he was ex-military, uh, there should be some additional considerations that should be had uh, in these situations. Now, in the body cam, they claim Brent Kopaka fired his gun. Uh, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. Had, have you seen that footage? I mean, I didn't hear a gunfire. I, I didn't either, but the claim is that he fired his gun. My question when I watch the, the body cam footage is it doesn't seem like he's firing a rifle, which is what they said he had a rifle or a shotgun, a larger gun. Okay. Uh, maybe the popping we hear in the body cam could be like a 22 or something very small caliber handgun. Um, but it, it, it is not a larger gun, a shouldered gun, uh, that's being fired there. And what's important with police is police should be matching aggression in these situations. Yeah. He didn't seem very aggressive. You don't hear anything from him. No. In the body cam, nothing. They were literally like sending drones and stuff in there to get proof of life. And, you know, like, I think there might be one part I kind of remember hearing him yell or something. And they were talking about getting him like a cigarette. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think I might remember. I honestly need to go back and re-listen. Yeah, I need to go back and re-listen too. But the important thing is walking people through what this connection is now again i i just want to be overly sensitive in this situation because like i said with kopaka serving in the the u.s army so he served in the army between 2005 and 2009 in the second battalion 508 parachute infantry regiment he was a fourth Br brigade combat team soldier veteran in the 82nd airborne Division, and he was awarded the Purple Heart for his service in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, where he sustained uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury, which happens from being blown up, um, which happens from, uh, you know, it hitting your head it, it hard. I, people have gotten it from, you know, taking a round in the helmet. Um, there, There's no... There's no reason or rhyme to TBI, and TBI is such a problem that we see in boxers and we see in football players when we see uh, in our soldiers. So, like TBI is scary stuff. It is scary, and it's super sad. It's super sad. It's scary. We've covered stories before where we've talked about, um, and I, I, I don't want to connect this with him. Okay, so that's not where I'm going. But we've talked about some serial enders in the past that there is some kind of connection to TBI, but normally it happens prepubescent in yeah. those serial enders. Yeah, they're like developing stuff. Yep, yeah, a prepubescent brain injury or head injury, which caused some kind of damage to that frontal lobe, which we've seen turn into some kind of sociopathic disconnection. That's true. But I think I, I need to go relook it up, but I do think I've heard of one who was not a child, who was an adult and their whole life changed after the brain injury. they like became a whole different person. I mean, you know, who else claims that is, uh, Alex, uh, what's his last name? Um, you guys are probably saying it for me right now. The the Alex Jones. Alex Jones. Alex Jones says that. Really? Yes. Yes. He got hit by a car. 
and uh, his entire character changed. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yep. I've I've heard that from numerous places about the care, you know, who you are, like in your character, or whatever changing. Um, but like you said, when it's somebody developing into like a serial killer, usually it's an adolescence when they suffer like a severe head trauma. And there's a lot of those cases. Like there's these certain hallmarks and markers and head trauma can be one of them. Um, usually not in adulthood though, even if it does change your whole personality. But I do believe there's one killer who had it in adulthood. Yeah. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it just because of how me how much it can change people. But it's on a case by case basis too. And sure. what's interesting here is, like I said, Brent Kopaka was in the military until oh nine. Okay, so that gave him what, uh, fi what fifteen years? So twenty two, yeah, fit right, thirteen years or something or sixteen. Uh, but Wait, he's, he's what been year? Oh, nine. Okay. So that's 2019. So 13 years. So he had been th out of the military for 13 years and, uh, yep. And he had been dealing with the TBI PTSD. He had PTSD he had TBI, and he had been managing that so, at, at least effectively to have his own apartment. And in my opinion, that says a lot. What in the last 16 years would cause someone all of a sudden in a way to lose it, you know? Did he have his own apartment? Yeah, he lived there. That was his apartment. Yeah, but you know, I, I don't remember where I heard this, but I've heard that I mean, it wasn't his apartment, and I don't know if he legitimately, like, I don't know if he just moved in and started living there, or, I don't know. There's some weird stuff around his living, too. Around his living? Yeah. Statements from people who did live there. What, that he was couch surfing or something? Kinda, I think. Okay, so we'll, we'll have to look into that when we dig into this more. Yeah, um, I, I do need to look into it more. Yeah, we just wanted to give uh, the the overview. Now, this needs to be brought up with it, okay? Um, because some very big creators have drawn these connections out there. Um, so there had been animals going missing. And for some, not animals going missing, animals getting hurt, animals being mutilated in the area. For some reason... Uh, Jack is connected to this in these theories, and Brent Kopaka is connected to this in these hoodie, theories. Hoodie guy. Yeah. So, um, and I, they not only were they going missing and being mutilated, they were then turning up on fraternity front steps, like people's front yards, too. fraternities, sororities. And I honestly think it might have been other neighbors, too, not just fraternities and sororities. But the most notable ones I can think of are the fraternity and sorority because of how bad it was. Um, but yeah, turning up in yards and front porches like somebody was putting it there on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you, you know what's interesting? And in, in the early reports with the Brent Kopaka story, you know they were saying that he worked in the IT department for WSU? Oh, really? Yeah. IT, Brian yeah. Koberger. Hello. In the early reports? In the early reports, yep. So it changed to, he, he then was a security guard at WSU. But a lot of people have drawn connection here because technology and technology. And if you're going to school for criminal-based technology, like cloud-based forensics, you would be heavily involved in the IT department in your school. Well, was there some kind of connection there? Other people have theorized. Did Brian Koberger know Br Brent Kopaka because maybe Brent Kopaka reached out on his survey? It, these are all interesting questions, interesting questions. And I've got to be honest with you guys, though. 
I'm worried about being able to come up with very concrete, objective evidence for these questions. I think part of the reason this has gotten so big is because we we don't have answers for these questions. Yeah. But I also think this is a very big coincidence, too. That's what I was going to ask you is if we have any idea what he did for work. Uh, I like, mean, like what was Brent Kopaka doing for a job? Security like, is what it says. So he was either security or uh, in the IT department with WSU. Interesting. And he worked for WSU. And he had a big knife collection. There had been some Wait. very weird things said about him. But yes, he worked for WSU. Whether it was IT or whether it was security, he worked at WSU is what the reports claim. Have I seen a paycheck? No, I haven't seen a paycheck. But this is what the reports say. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Yep. And, uh, you know, there, did he work at DeSales? <laughs> that, I don't know. Um, you know, there's been, there's been some advocates that have come out for Brent Kopaka. One of them is a Darren Duncan, which who we talked about just a minute ago, uh, was actually the person who was called by law enforcement and never called back to try and get him in contact with his friend, which, and I haven't seen this called out anywhere. So why didn't they tell Darren to call Brent? His phone was on the counter wiped. Why know. didn't they yell through the speaker to like plug your phone in? Darren Duncan's trying to call you. Or just, you know, fly one of those drones in there remote control car with a phone on it. Yeah, so, I don't know. Darren Duncan has been avidly fighting against people connecting Brent Kopaka to the Idaho Four, which I understand that. I understand that. I I it, it, if one of my very best friends and good friends was a soldier and dedicated his life, literally his life, limb and freedom to the safety of the country, uh, only to be connected to a potential mass homicide, which there's nothing that says he wasn't connected and trying to stop it either. Okay. He, maybe he's connected it in a way where he's trying to be the good guy. Maybe he heard something we, we don't know. Okay. I think most people automatically go to a negative connection. Like, Brent Kopaka can be a dangerous guy. He had a knife collection. He was a, a, an army trained combat veteran. Uh, he had the capabilities of doing this. What's interesting, though, is like with the Idaho Four, none of us have actual factual confirmation of how long that crime took to be committed. So, does that change the storyline in the Idaho Four? Just going tin hat here. If someone doesn't only have nine minutes to complete it, could an average person without any training do this in 45 minutes? Could they have done this in two different situations where two of the roommates came home first you know, did this, shut the door, clean themselves up, walk through the house, left no marks, and then waited in the closet for the two women. Hmm. I think uh, being somebody who has no experience, I think it would be really, really hard to not leave anything behind and be quick. Um, but, like... I guess, see, here's an argument that's been said from for a long time now from people mainly who think Brian Cooper is 100% guilty and will not see anything, like won't see it any other way, which that's your prerogative. That's your right. That's whatever. Um, but it's that all the evidence points to Brian Cooper. However, all the evidence points to Brian Cooper because we have a PCA that was written to point to Brian Koberger. What if there's a bunch more evidence 
that doesn't. And we're not going to hear about it because this is Brian Koberger's trial. I, I've i said that from the beginning because so, of the Karen Reed case. Right. Exactly. So what if there is evidence somebody was there in, you know, say, cleaned up because there's no tracking of, you know, footprints with like fluid on them going through the home and indications of someone being there a lot longer, but it doesn't fit into their timeline and they have the car here and here at this time. And they're like, well, it, ha it has to be this way. So I don't like, that doesn't really make sense, but like it literally has to be between this time and this time because that's when he gets here and that's when he leaves. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I, I do know. I, I just, what if somebody, because they're focusing on that car and that person, they don't see the person, you know, on foot sneaking out the through the woods evidence, an yeah. hour later. Yeah. And no, I, I agree with you that that biased evidence for sure. I, I think that we see that really big in the, the cell phone evidence, whereas, uh, you know, they only pulled a very short time frame of cell phone evidence for for the data drop from the tower when they should have pulled the entire week leading up to it, in my opinion, um, to see what kind of connections there were in that area, you know, to that tower, which would have been a lot of data. But let's be real here. We're over a year in and uh, they still haven't shared all the evidence. So they would have had time to filter through everything. Now. Another interesting connection between Brian Koberger and Brent Kopaka is when Brian Koberger is pulled over two times in Indiana, he mentions the Brent Kopaka situation in both of them. Well, his dad. No, nope, he did. Koberger brought them up first? Yes. Yes. Yep. His dad finishes his sentence because he's closer to the officer, but... Brian Koberger says it first, and then his dad picks up the conversation. Yes. That's really weird. It is a little strange, but you got to remember that Brian Koberger was a WSU student, meaning his cell phone was uploaded into the college uh, database, so he would be getting alerts when to shelter. And yeah. Brent Kopaka had an eight hour standoff, you guys. Eight hour standoff during this situation. Yeah. The the reset hmm. phone is really strange. The reset phone is really strange. And you know, there have been other creators out there, other creators that we respect, that we love, that we like a lot, that have highlighted other things too. Like, I, you know, Brent Kopaka had a knife collection, but I know a ton of people who have a knife collect collection. That doesn't make you guilty, right? We can't fall into the same traps that we're speaking out against with Brian Koberger. Whereas, oh, well, this person has this thing, so they must have done it. No, we can't do that. We got to look at Brent Kopaka objectively. What is some objective connections here with Brian Koberger, right? He liked knives. Okay. So that means he had the ability to have a weapon that could have done this crime, right? He was obsessed with horror movies. Well, that's interesting. I'm obsessed with horror movies. You know, I didn't go out and end people's lives last night because I like horror movies. Um, but. Great point. <laughs> I think the interesting evidence is the fact that they lived literally a stone's throw apart from each other on either coast from Pennsylvania to Washington. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal. It is a big deal. Very big deal. They both worked and or went to school at WSU. Okay. That, that, that really sells me more than anything. Is that they worked at the same place. They are unwilling to release the 911 call. He, Who's on that call? He wiped his phone. No, no, no. The yeah, that's that's a big deal too. But on that nine one one call, who is on that call? Right. When somebody calls into nine one one, there's only two people: the dispatcher 
and the person calling in. Why aren't they willing to let us hear the person that's calling in? Especially if it's just one of the roommates saying, hey, he's trying to kill me. It, right. But it's not. Yeah, but they like that's such a weird thing to hold back if it's just his roommate saying, hey, he's trying to kill me. Um, I mean, it's weird that why is it? Why does this area of the country not want to give 911 calls? It's really weird, especially it's with weird. these cases. It's weird because then it, that's not normal. It's not normal to not give a 911 call. It's not normal. And and then to try and condemn the general public like us here who are interested in the safety of our civilization um, and have interest in cases like these to make people like us or the people like you watching this uh, make all of us feel bad because we have an interest here is absolutely wrong and absolutely absurd. This is public information and these things are supposed to be released so we can understand how safe we really are. Like the, our country is supposed to be a democracy here, you know, meaning we vote and or control these institutions. I agree with you. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense you know, and it draws really nasty conclusions when people are trying to understand what's going on. Exactly. Exactly. And if this case is closed, which it is, according to Washington State Police, um, they have concluded there was no wrongdoing by the police officer who shot him, which I don't agree with. Um but they've this is case closed. That's why we have the body cam now. That's why we have any information because for the longest time, nobody could get anything. It was locked tight. You couldn't get nothing because it was still under investigation. They were investigating the officers who shot him. Well, case closed, then give us everything. Why I continue agree. to hide things? It's like Hudson Lindau. If he just had an accidental drowning, why not give the autopsy findings? You know? Mm -hmm. Like, why do we have to go off the coroner's word? That's not yeah. fair to the public. If it's you not. want the public to trust you, you have to be transparent. Yeah. You have to give the reports. I agree. I not agree. just expect us to take you at your word. Yeah. That's not acceptable. This is America, okay? But this is video one on the Brent Kopaka subject, and we'll be diving into it a lot more. I hope I gave you guys a really good rundown, really thorough into some of the speculation and some of the why behind people are interested in this. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and let those thoughts riot. And let us know if you want us to go deeper down the rabbit hole. I mean, we are. We are. Well, There's actual evidence. This is just video one. You can tell us still though <laughs> yeah we are going to be talking about Caden Patrick Young he is a student or was he was a student of the University of Idaho um who unfortunately passed away um there's been much speculation within the community that follows the Idaho 4 case um, about some of the people involved in his death and if they played some role in the Idaho 4 massacre or if they were somehow like involved like in the victim's community, you know, like if they knew them. Um, the Greek yeah, if community. They, yeah, yeah, because the people that were involved in Caden Young's unfortunate passing um he died way too young um were drug dealers and that is not speculation that is fact um you know the people we're talking about here one is a, a young woman and one is um a you know 36 probably 37 now um year old man who has a rap sheet a, like a rap sheet okay it's pretty long and it's pretty extensive and it's pretty violent um so i don't feel bad talking about it 
Yeah, I mean, I I think it's fair to talk about anything that's public record out there. I I mean, I think we can talk about anything as long as we're respectful. Yeah. So I agree. Um. So let's let's talk. Who was Caden Young? Um. Caden was born November tenth, the year two thousand, in Boise, Idaho. He was the youngest of his family. Um, he was described as independent, caring, um, curious, a critical thinker, clever sense of humor, and had a stunning range of abilities. Um, he was a really good football player. Actually, there are numerous interviews with him on the internet. Hmm. All right, I am with Emmett High quarterback Caden Young, who's celebrating a thrilling 28-27 quarterfinal win over Blackfoot. How you feeling, man? Oh, it's great right now. It's great. Um, we were down one, and the defense got a safety. That might have been the best feeling I've ever had. Um, and then we didn't run the clock down, but the defense helped us out again. Um, big thanks to the defense. After winning games oh, when he awesome. was in high school, so like star player. Type. Yes, Got he it. was a star player. I think he was a quarterback, but I'm blanking on that. I think he was a star quarterback, but if I'm wrong on that, please correct me in the comments. I just know he was a really good football player. But when he went to the U of I, he seemed to leave that behind and instead pursued investigative journalism wow. and started writing for the Argonaut, the school paper. Interesting switch. Very interesting switch from yeah. jock to fraternity bro, but an investigative journalist. Yeah, and while in a fraternity, that's and so he was strange. the president okay. of his fraternity, um, of Alpha Kappa Lambda. Okay, he went from the secretary to the president, so he moved up. Does it say anywhere in there what year he was when this happened? Was he a four-year? Do you know if he was going for his master's? So, if not, I can look for it while you... Um, so it sounds like his brother also went to the U of I. Um, numerous of his brothers actually went to the U of I. He repeatedly made the dean's list, held every, every high-ranking position in his beloved fraternity. Um, he was scheduled, scheduled to graduate in journalism with a minor in anthropology next fall. Okay. And he passed in 2023. So, so fourth year going into his yeah. fourth year. Got it. Okay. Exactly. Anthropology was his minor. Very interesting. Um, he had many plans that he was going to pursue. Um, Though this seems impossibly difficult for us, we are extremely spiritual family and embrace the thought, speak of the dead often, for that is how they live. Carmack McCarthy. That's a quote that they put in his obituary. Yeah, that's a really nice quote. I like that. He is with us, he is in us, and we talk with him daily, often laughing, sometimes crying, but always, regardless of what the moment brings, appreciative of the smart, clever, multi-gifted, wonderful chucklehead Caden, our beloved brother and son. Hmm. Yeah, I think with maybe the, his nickname was Cade because they keep calling him Cade in there too. With him being an investigative journalist, I've seen people draw connections like, hmm, had these people possibly accidentally run into something like Caden Young, like Kaylee Gonzalez, who was also very interested in true crime and a curious George. Well, her mom, were Christy, Kaylee's mom, literally described her as a sleuth. Literally said in an interview, Kaylee was a sleuth. I wonder what's on her computer. Right? I mean, they haven't given the family any of her tech back. None of it. Yeah. And the very first search warrant for like a social media, I think, is Kaylee on Reddit. If it's not the first, you guys, that Reddit search warrant was obtained in November, like the end of November, I think November 29th for Kaylee. Reddit, of all places. Yeah, I've Which said- Which is very interesting. The Gonzalez need to hire me if they went into her stuff. You know, you don't have to have a computer. 
to get everything that's on a computer. Yeah. You don't have to like have it, someone's phone to get everything that's on that phone. Yeah. And I think that they know some of that. I think that's how they got some of her stuff is from backups and cloud and stuff like that. But mm. anyway, um, so now we're going to, I wanted to take a minute to honor Caden because he did seem like a really great, bright young man. He, he did seem that way. Um, and I'm sure he was, and it's really sad how he passed. And, you know, we've talked about the statistics with addiction and fraternities that say the statistic one out of every two, one out of every two people that come out of a fraternity end up addicted to a substance. And one out of every three women leave their sorority assaulted. Essayed. Right. Uh, I think the stat that I read is assault in general. I think they combined, you know, sexual and physical. Um, I think if it's just SA, it's one out of four, but overall assault is one out of every three. Wow. If I'm remembering correct, I'm, I'm trying to pull that out of my head without verifying in front of me. So, but I believe that's correct. And, you know, addiction is not just like it you know i've heard so many people say like there's no way some of these victims or whatever were addicted to anything or were using any kind of drugs and i think kaden is a perfect example of that's not true you don't have to look like an addict you don't have to look like anything like this drugs partying addiction is not just like a poor, ugly person's disease, which I don't believe in ugly people, but I'm just saying, you know, like that's what people act like is like, you have to look a certain type of way. You have to look rough or you have to look poor or something. And that's, you know, you can look like an upstanding person. You know, the world's businessmen, a lot of them are addicts. Like yeah. some of the richest people on the planet are addicts. I think finally just this last year, the statistic changed, but for like three years running before this last year uh the the leading demographic for opiate abuse was actual soccer moms were moms so women that That's had so children sad. of a mother's age between you know thir i think they said I don't remember for sure. I'll say 30 or 40. 30s or 40s is what I'm remembering they quoted in their demographic and a mother. And that was the key demographic that was uh, abusing opiates. So, yeah, it is not a homeless person on your corner that is prioritizing food over dope. Yes, some of those people are addicts. Yes, some of them are on that street because of addiction. Um, but one out of every two fraternity members leave addicts and you or can, alcoholics, and which you can, same thing, but you, you know. Yeah, and you can be a, a functioning addict. And that doesn't mean you function in every aspect of your life. You may function well in, you know, maintaining your job and making money and supporting yourself and your habit, but you can really suck at all your relationships. You know what I mean? Or other yes. things. Um, so it, functioning doesn't mean functioning in every way and being perfect and okay. Um, you know, you're going to fail in some aspects when you have a mental illness like addiction. Yes. But. So let's let's move on to this article that I've seen tons of people bring up back when this happened. And it's from the Chronicle. Title is two people allegedly connected to March overdose death in Centralia released days before scheduled trial. So. This is Emma Bailey, who was 22 at the time, and Demetrius Robinson, who was 36 uh, mm. Emma Bailey, fun fact, lived right behind 1122 King Road. Her parents' house is right behind there. Really interesting. Yeah. Like, she's literally could just, like, walk across the street. Or I think she has to go through some, like, stairs. I don't know why there's so many stairs between residential streets in that area. But I think there's, like, some stairs and then, like, she's, like, there. 
That's interesting. Yeah, it's super, 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 super interesting. And this is a topic, these people is a, is a topic that everyone has wanted us to talk about for a long time. We're just now getting to some of these topics for you guys. So, um, yeah, because the Emma and Demetrius stuff started getting brought up to us like a really long time ago, many, many months ago. I would say 10 months ago. <laughs> you know, it was mid 2003 or 2003 2023 um when people were like you got to look into these people and while i i'm not convinced that they are a part of the deaths i do think there's some interesting things here um and i think that we could dive even deeper into this you guys but there's some interesting things here that are indicators of me on what was going on around frat row what was going on in this neighborhood? What was going on in Pullman and Moscow when it comes to the drug game? And to think that none of the victims or people associated with the victims were at least doing party drugs? Oh, yeah. It, it's a college. I I mean, it, for me at least, right? I understand that you're being All objective in your approach. Um, but uh, every single college, every single one, every Single Every single person in that house did party drugs. Has a major guaranteed. Has a major drug problem. Yeah. Every single college. Well, there isn't a single one. It, what's really interesting is I. I don't know about that house, but I suggest looking up how traffickers literally target universities and towns. It's a never-ending market. You constantly have new people coming in. These are young people looking to party. Like it is the perfect environment to push drugs. Yeah. And also getting them to be foot soldiers for you. Fraternities and college kids are literally targeted. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, it, they're willing users. Yeah. So it's not like they're targeted in a way where they're like, oh, these poor college kids. No, they're look, college is about, Finding They're yourself willingly participating, yes, and partying and uh, you know, doing all the things you wish you could have done while living in your parents' house at high school. That's a, that's what it's about finding your freedom. So, most of these kids are, are ready to go, and I think that these statistics around fraternities being one in two, uh, leave an alcoholic or, or addict, um add to the reliability that they could be a source to to deal one out of every two is using a substance that that is that's a reliable percentage jeez mhm mm i know so now let's get to basically what happened okay um Emma and Demetrius were arrested uh, March 21st of 2023 about Caden's death. Um, they spent two months in jail, two months and five days, uh, and were about to literally face like trial. Like they were setting trial. Um, and then they literally just got released. And the judge dismissed all charges. And there's been many oh, questions wow. over, and I, I literally have some documents here proving it's dismissed. Like now they did dismiss it without prejudice, meaning they could refile these charges if they wanted to, but yeah, they, well, duh, that's, they haven't. That's when someone turns. What do you mean? That, that, that is how they file and or drop charges. When somebody is feeding information to the police, they want to be able to refile these. If they don't, uphold their duties of giving information mm -hmm. exactly and that's that's a known fact in the whole drug game with the police the police will target people to turn and tell them information about what's going on in an area absolutely so they were each charged with one count of conspiracy to commit violation of the Uniform Controlled Substances Act in Lewis County Superior Court following a joint narcotics enforcement team investigation. Uh, on May 25th, the Lewis County Prosecutor's Office filed motions to dismiss the cases against Bailey and Robinson without prejudice. And 
you know, the the judge canceled the trial and was like, yeah, I'll dismiss all the charges. Um, so they are acute. They were accused of delivering cocaine to the man <clears throat> who to Caden, who was visiting from the university. He was visiting a friend, a fraternity brother. Um and partying and they delivered him cocaine and he OD'd um in Seattle on March 20th because it was cut with fentanyl yes yeah, P- yeah. i've heard a bunch of people saying that's not true it is true no dude. it is 100% true and i have the report proving it's true it is so um, hard to overdose on cocaine well, you guys that is he did not just have cocaine and fentanyl yeah. in his body he oh. had more than that Oh. So we'll get to that in a second. So he received care, uh, Caden received care at Harbor View Medical Center for an overdose. Um, he was discharged at 2 a.m. and picked up by a friend. I've heard many people say that, it, that Emma literally picked him up. I don't know if that's a fact mm. or if it was his other friend. Um, but it does seem that they did meet back up. So... And he OD'd again, and this time actually died. Um, but oh. we can go into more. Two back to back? What? Yeah. So the friend told law enforcement he went to sleep and stopped breathing shortly before the friend called 911. Um, and they were being held on a $100,000 bond. 100000 each, by the way, which is quite a bit. Um, but I, I found an article that goes way more into depth about this and I highly appreciated it, highly appreciated it because there's a lot of confusion surrounding what exactly happened and if the cocaine was cut or not, it was, it absolutely was cut with fentanyl because when they revived him, Like, or when they were trying to get him out of it, he responded to Narcan and they obviously did toxicology. Mm -hmm. And I, we have that report. Um, anyway, so. Yeah, I, I, it's so rare to OD on cocaine, you guys. Like I, for anybody that has absolutely no knowledge of these things, can you overdose on cocaine? Yes, you absolutely can. But a lot of time you go into a cardiac arrest where your heartbeat is pumping too much. It's not the same kind of OD that you would see in uh, opiates. And it's actually a lot harder. I've known people that have massive, huge, insane tolerances with cocaine where they're able to do like you know, five grams a night or five grams a day. Yeah. With opiates, it does not work like that, especially when you're messing with fentanyl, especially when, uh, you don't know fentanyl's in your cocaine. Look at the Kansas three, right? Same situation. It is exactly the same situation. Um, and I, I don't know if we have the full toxicology report for them yet. Is the full one out? I'm not sure. Anyway, so. that's not the topic. Sorry. Okay, so Caden Young is the first time, okay, he ODs, he gets revived using CPR and Narcan, Um, and then he is released less than 12 hours later. Then, seven hours after that, he dies in his sleep on March 21st. And I, there's reports of him snoring and a cop said that snoring is like him taking his last bits of air. That's what it reminded the cop of. I don't know if there's some kind of recording or something, but I don't know. A maybe the friend was described dying. I don't Why know. Wasn't someone giving him CPR. Yeah, I don't know. I, let me look for the snoring comment. That's real quick. really strange because, uh, you know, if someone is like out and you're hearing weird sounds and you're noticing that their breathing is suppressed, why wouldn't you give them CPR? Yeah, I don't know. I don't understand it. This I describes the whole situation, though. Oh, yes. So the, a friend showed the police a video he took of Young snoring loudly at 8 a.m. Based on the snore, I recognize it to sound similar to the snorting uh, sound people who are dying commonly did with their last breaths. 
This is what Officer Timothy O'Dell wrote in his police report. Okay, so let's let's get into what actually happened that, that night. That doesn't you guys. sound objective at all. Uh, no, not really. But um, anyway, so the police report the police report basically describes a chaotic a chaotic series of events. Okay, it's a mess, um, and this is in a hotel in Seattle where Emma and Demetrius are. Um, and this is where both of them summon emergency responders on March 20th. Um, they said nothing out of the ordinary occurred between his exit from the hospital and his arrival at a friend's apartment in Centralia, 83 miles away. So Emma and Demetrius, after he overdoses, like he, literally 83 miles away from his friend that he's supposed to be visiting. And he's in Seattle with Emma and Demetrius in a hotel. The, that's really strange uh so emma knew him from the u of i uh the friend who reported young's death later contacted the woman on behalf of the police to try to set up a meeting to purchase drugs according to the police report so the police could find her um, love you guys, but not right now. Emma responded on Snapchat. That was super scary working through the situation. This man literally died in D's arms. We love Caden and I want him to be straight and I want to make sure he rests and is taken care of and understands how serious that was. I want to see him healthy. We love you guys. And then they feed him more. I guess so. Or he stole it. I have no idea. Because, you know, if somebody's like a real addict, if and you have it on you, they're not, they may not take no for an answer. They may wait till you go to sleep. <laughs> this sounds like a whole night of partying. He OD'd in the morning. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I'm not sure. But, um, So, so he was staying with his former fraternity brother in Centralia, the same man that would pick him up from the hospital and take him home the day he died. Young then traveled to Seattle where he spent time in the Holiday Inn with Emma and Demetrius. The hotel manager told police she received a call from the woman asking the manager to call 911 on March 20th, the manager and maintenance worker went up to the room to find Young lying unconscious, vomiting, and blue in color. Uh, the manager told the, told police the man and woman were freaking out. The man splashed ice water on Young, slapped him in the face, and was performing CPR until the medics arrived. Um, after medics used a low dose of naloxone, which is like, it's Narcan, uh, to revive him, he began breathing again and became conscious. The police reported that the man and woman seemed emotional with the woman falling to her knees and the man hitting the wall and saying, thank God. Police said the man made a statement to an officer confirming that Caden ingested fentanyl. At 2.23 p.m., Young was taken to Harborview Medical Center. He was treated for his fentanyl overdose. The hospital released him at 2 a.m. March 21st, which is his former fraternity brother that picked him up. So he was treated and then released. We can't get anything about his medical trip, obviously, because of HIPAA. Um, after he picked him after. So the fraternity brother told the police that after he picked up Caden, Caden fell asleep multiple times on the drive back to the apartment and was so out of it that the friend had to guide him because he could not keep his eyes open. Young fell asleep at the apartment at 4.30 a.m. and the Centralia friend checked on him for several hours, according to the police statements. Okay, so that's... the. Do you understand what's happening? What? So, Emma and Demetrius were not there the second time. Okay, okay. They were only there the first time. Got it. So... He's with them in Seattle at the Holiday Inn. He ODs. He gets treatment for that OD. And then his fraternity brother picks him up. And clearly, 
he still has dope on him. Yeah. From Emma and Demetrius. Yeah. Because he was passing out in the car on the way home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's when, you know, his friend kept checking on him after that over and over. That's when he took the video and ended up showing it to the police officer and that whole thing about the snoring. Um, and at 8.39 a.m., the friend woke up to Caden unresponsive. The friend and a roommate attempted CPR and called 911 at 907. Why did it take them that long to call 911? He was unresponsive at 8:39 a.m. and they were doing CPR and didn't call 911 until 907. I don't know. That's like 20 minutes. minutes. 8.39 a.m. to 9.07. Yeah, 30 minutes. Why would you wait that long? That seems sketchy to me. If I wake up and somebody's unresponsive and or blue, I'm calling 911 immediately and doing CPR while I'm on the phone. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I, you I guys, agree if you. someone's ODing, do not wait to call. Call immediately. Yeah. No matter what. It is It is literally life or death. Like, you have to call. It is. So, first responders arrive. They don't get a pulse. Um, so, they did a drug test on um, Caden. And he was he had passed. He had fentanyl, benzodiapines, marijuana, <sighs> cocaine, and alcohol all in his system. Oh, opiates and benzos are so dangerous. Well, he My had gosh. Okay, fentanyl, benzodiapines, marijuana, and alcohol are all downers. They are they depress your central nervous system. Cocaine is an upper. That's a whole lot of downers. And yes, opiates and benzodiapines do not mix well. Like you can very easily overdose, not even using fentanyl, using something else that's weaker with benzos like Xanax. Um, if you mix opiates and Xanax, it's a bad combination. It can get real dangerous real fast. Yeah, geez. And he had all of that in his system. So... Police believe the woman who provided the drugs to Caden um, was a safety concern and was actively trafficking cocaine that was laced with fentanyl. They tracked her down immediately. Um, her license plate was entered into the flock camera system, which was automated license plate recognition technology, and police began tracking her phone. Using phone pings, they were able to find her and Demetrius. Officers arrested them. And that's where we're at now. They found a white substance in the woman's car. Um, it was cocaine containing fentanyl. Yep. Interesting. So that is what happened when Caden passed away. And um, I wanted to read through all that because I thought it was important because like most people, I was confused and also thought that Emma and Demetrius were involved with the entire thing, okay? That they were like, they picked it, because this is exactly how it was said on multiple channels, is that they picked him up from the hospital and gave him more drugs. And they might have given him more drugs, you guys, because he clearly had some when he got out of the hospital. Or else he wouldn't have OD'd again. Yeah. So they very well could have been like, because if you have been on this stuff for a while, you're going to withdraw. So they could have given him more. I mean, they totally could have. Or he had some left in his bag or something. You would think the police would check, though, and make yeah. sure he doesn't. I would think, um, well, not, the police don't always go to an OD, so. The but, police absolutely went. I mean, I've I've been there when police don't go. You're sure okay, the but, police went? Yes, the, the first OD? Yes, the police came. Okay. How do you know? I don't know. It just said first responders. You're right. Now that I'm thinking about it. Police don't always go. 
Not for ODs. Huh. You would think they would. Why? Why wouldn't you? I mean, I don't think they need to charge drug addicts. I don't either. Then why go? Might have saved Caden's life. I don't know. Anyway, this charge didn't stick, clearly, you guys. And I would like um, to add this video clip of the hearing and give credit to the channel that it's on where the charges get dropped. Um, and I also want to mention that Demetrius Robinson, Robinson has a very extensive, and I mean extensive, rap sheet. But the weird thing is, is that he hasn't had any charges stick that I have been able to find since 2019. Everything has been dismissed that he was charged with. All right, I signed that order. Uh, Mr. Robinson, your matter is dismissed and you will be, you should be released on this matter today unless you're being held on anything else. What? All right. All right, and then you want to call Emma May Bailey? I don't know. Sorry, I don't have Bailey present at the moment, but I will in just a minute. That's fine. Who do you have next? This is a signature on the omnibus order. I would say versus Emma Bailey, 23 1 167, uh, Will Halstead for the state. Clark? I'm here. Oh, Jake Clark for the uh, defendant. And then, uh, yeah, did the other one. Okay. okay. So I'll hand it up to the court uh, motion in order to discuss without prejudice at this time, as well as I have to. And I've signed off, Your Honor. I see that. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bailey, I've just signed an order dismissing your case without prejudice. You'll be released on this matter. Uh, today, if you don't have any other holds. Do you have any questions? No, Your Honor. All right. That's all. Thank you. I believe that's all for the jail at this time, Your Honor. He gets charged for something, it gets dismissed. He gets charged for something, it gets dismissed. Including this with Caden. Interesting. Odd. And this is a violent criminal. He, on his rap sheet, he has things like literally holding somebody hostage and beating her like a girl holding, like there was some kidnapping or something like that um, and holding her and literally harming her. Um, he has SA. He has numerous charges that are extremely violent and he is a known drug trafficker. And with the kind of stuff that was on their social media when, you know, like it was very clear when you look at D Demetrius and Emma's social media, they were like a couple or like partners in crime or whatever, because they're both, you know, like trying to promote her as a model and, you know, acting like they're some kind of gurus uh, and can give people advice and they're going to become millionaires and literally had pictures like of coke like they weren't hiding it Jeez. if you're gonna show pictures of like coke in the background does that are you just stupid or is it you're untouchable because you are basically have a salary because you're an informant <laughs> you know what i mean like you're a full-time informant because sure this feels like it it sure seems that way it sure seems that way. Yeah. So based off of his rap sheet and then the fact that no charges have stuck since 2019 and they're serious charges, all of them, every single one gets dismissed. And that's why I want to play this little piece of the court hearing where it gets dismissed because they clearly made a deal. Yeah. This is the here. only channel that I've seen have any of the court hearing, which shout out to you. It's absolutely incredible that you have that. Um, I wish I could get like the raw footage, but you know, that would take a little while. 
I'd, I'd have to send in a FOIA and I'm, I'm just not patient enough. So I want to know what you guys think about the story. I want like, did you know the full story of what actually happened to Caden? Because honestly, I was still a little confused before I read all of it on camera. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't know it, but it's interesting. And look at the evidence there with them getting off on charges. Like even Emma, where we saw her throw, take that thing out of her pants. On body, on the camera footage, the body cam footage where she took something out of her pants and threw it in the trash. Yeah. You can't tell me the cops didn't see that and got her DUI um, thrown out too. Yeah. Interesting. Sounds like some informants to me, guys. Um, and it's pretty blatantly obvious if I'm being honest. It doesn't even feel like speculation at this point. Um Anyway, I want to know what you guys think about it all. Um, do you think there's any connection here? There have been a lot of connections made between Emma and uh, the victims of the Idaho for killings. And we could go deeper into those connections because there's quite a few. Like she lives right behind them. And there's a lot more uh, like the six roommate and lots of other things. So if you want us to dig deeper into this topic, definitely let me know. Let me know your opinions. And that's it. All right. All right, you guys, let's dig in to number two of the theories and potential suspects of the community um, that you guys showed interest in. Now, I know I just talked about this on my last story, and I'm going to talk about it again because it's the second one here. So I just put this pull out uh, last week asking about um, what topics you guys would like to hear. And number two on that list is the Jacks. This time we are talking about Jack Showalter. All right. Jack Showalter in the Idaho four case, uh, looking at some of the connections that are there that have to do with the Idaho four case. And uh, it will be a, an open conversation talking through some of the details. Now, why do you think Jack Showalter got brought up in this way? Um, I think he was brought up because um, of the grub truck video, obviously. he uh, It's odd. Like, he walks with them there. Um, then they, like, ignore him the whole time. And then they ditch him. And he, a lot of people felt like he was like stalking them. It doesn't necessarily seem like he's stalking them. Um, but it definitely intrigued people because, you know, right after that, they go home and are, you know, never seen again. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people it's an try odd and situation. talk about the grub truck footage and I guess forget the, you know, what did you tell Adam? That is one of the most important parts, yeah. and it's not even in the grub truck footage. No, it's not in the grub truck footage, but that that's a very important part because that proves there there's no stalking going on there. No, he was literally talking to them. Yeah, they knew each other. There, yeah. There's no weird stalking going on. So why they ditched him, that's a little bit strange. I, I don't know why. I don't know what was going on there. I don't know if they were just drunk i don't know if they were like let's just leave without saying anything ha 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 drunk giggle you know what i mean we don't know we don't know but i think that it's highly subjective to automatically go bad faith in any situation i don't think that's a fair assumption and assessment of any situation no, he just might have thought they were cute and wanted to hang out with them. He might. I mean, it, it sounds like there was personal connection there. But yeah, um, you know, it, it, there's been some connections that I found. So Maddie's boyfriend is uh, or was um, Jake. Don't remember his last name. It's Jake something. Um, and they, the fraternity or Greek life call him, you know, Rogaine Jack or Rogaine Jake or whatever, because he was losing his hair, like on the top part of his head. 
Um, and Jack Showalter and Maddie Madison Mogan's boyfriend, Jake, went to high school together and were in the same class. And then both went to this college or were in the area uh, for the same year in college. So a lot of people believe that, uh, you know, Showalter was like, hey, I'm looking out for my best friend's girlfriend. Is there any evidence they were actually best friends? No, but bro's girlfriend. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't think guys I think that's like, possible. are like, yeah, we're BFFs, you know? But I mean, that would make sense, though, because they were pretty drunk. Um, they were pretty drunk walking. Like real drunk. Yeah, walking the Super street. drunk. <laughs> Very, very drunk. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, side note here, just because we just brought that up. But, uh, you know, what's interesting is you remember in the Steve Gonsalves text messages, how it says all their uh, toxicology reports are clear. Yeah. Yeah. They were really drunk. All of them were out partying that night. So how are they clear? Yeah, they couldn't have been. They could not have been. It's not possible. So the real question is. Who has the bad information? Was the Gonzalez's told the wrong information if those texts are real? Or are the texts fake? <laughs> or are the texts fake? Yeah. I don't know. If the if the Gonzalez's really think that the toxicology was clear, and maybe they mean clear as in no narcotics. Maybe that's all they cared about. Is like, okay, yeah, there's weed and alcohol, but that's like a normal day. Maybe. Don't know. But uh, all right. So we look into Jack Showalter. And so now let's go to objective evidence of why I, I think a lot of people drew this connection is. Statistically, the last person to see somebody alive. Is statistically the one who's involved the majority of the time. The majority. It is step one in a police investigation of any kind. Doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if a life was lost. It doesn't matter if there was some kind of robbery. They start with the last person backwards. Well, Jack Showalter was it. I mean, the last person to see them alive is the murderer always. Yeah. Yeah. You mean the last known person? Yeah. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So... Um, I had to troll you for a minute. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so yeah, I think that's the obvious connection that a lot of people made. And I think that it's fair that a lot of people made that connection. Yeah. I think that is, I think it's important to ask those questions. Like, yeah, it is. he needed to be cleared. He absolutely did. He needed to be cleared. And a lot of people think when the Gonsalves came out and said, Hey, People were cleared way too quick that they were literally talking about Jack Showalter. Now, that's a subjective connection that the community made that I have no evidence of, you guys. So, Well, people um, also thought the roommates, too. Yeah, but it it's interesting. It's interesting because, you know, again, looking objectively at police investigations, the person, the go-to person here would be Jack Showalter or the roommates, right? We don't know if the roommates actually saw them get home, if they had an interaction or anything like that, or if Jack Showalter was the last one. Um, now, by all accounts, from what we hear, and we don't have evidence of this, this is just rumor from uh, victims' families in the community, is that Jack Showalter willingly came forward and submitted his DNA and a lie detector test. Jack Showalter. Yep. Came forward and submitted a lie detector test and DNA. I thought they said that about Jack Decor. Uh, if they're doing lie detector tests, they are not going to only do it on one person. If they had that lie detector out, they probably did it to 100 people, literally. Um, now, when people started digging into Jack Showalter's background... Um, people found out that he was a hunter, that he, in his hunting pictures with big game kills, um, he had a knife that looked like it could have matched what the police were looking for. 
Mm-hmm. Interesting, right? People drew some conclusions with that. Uh, it, he came from a very rich or wealthy family that people felt like there could be a way to cover things up, to smooth things over, to be able to make important calls and say, hey, I need you to look this way and not that way. You know? So, interesting. Um, but... Uh, when you watch the food truck footage, what do you get from it? Oh, it's hard. Um, I've watched it. I've watched it through a lot of other creators who have pointed out certain things. Um, I see, honestly, I just see two drunk girls waiting for food. One thing that really stuck out to me is Kaylee was on her phone the whole time and they were talking about something. They were talking about something. Yeah. She was on her phone the whole time. That is what stuck out to me. Um, all the other people around them didn't, I mean, they all seem like they're having a good time and just chit chatting except for there, there is something that stuck out to me after somebody pointed it out. And that is sorority sisters that, you know, they're, they're literally sorority sisters acting like they don't know Kaylee or Maddie, not saying hi, not acknowledging them, which that sticks out to me after somebody pointed that out. It is strange. Yeah. I don't know what it means, but we did, we have heard, okay, that literally not a single one of these victims were in good standing with their fraternities. Ethan was supposedly on, you know, like um, probation, basically, because of academics. Um, and Zan wait, was it Zana that left? Like, I think Kaylee, Zana, and Maddie had all left. Yeah. Is the assumption. Because um, their, frater their sororities are not listed on the U of I website. Right. Yeah. And Kaylee, was, Kaylee was leaving. Strange coincidence, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, I see connections there, um, but uh, yeah, when I when I look at the food truck footage, for the most part, you guys, I see normal behaviors. When you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I know True. that is such an obvious statement that everyone has heard. Everyone who's watching this has heard. It's a really good point. But you have to remind yourself of that all the time. Because our feelings want there to be something there for us to give us reason why this horrible, once in a lifetime horrible situation happened, right? When I'm watching it, I don't see anything obvious that stands out there. I've, I've given my concern with the Linda Lane footage too, where, uh, you know, I, I, Nothing can be used in court there, so I have a very hard time wanting to put my time into Linda Lane um, because any sounds can't be verified. We don't. E I've never seen the original footage. We verify it through the metadata. Um, it, it, and the food truck, the grub truck was such a big deal. I feel very similar to that, that... There's so many different people and personalities in front of that video camera that I don't know any of them personally. I don't know if any of them have weird little ticks that somebody might be like, oh, you see them doing that right there? That sign means something. Or they could just have a weird little tick about them. You know what I mean? That that doesn't make sense to anyone that doesn't know them. So I have a very hard time with that. It's very interesting, the conversation uh, that they were having, though. It's interesting that they were having an engaging conversation while walking from Corner Club uh, to the food truck. And then it's interesting that they were, they separated from him, started having their own conversation, and then literally ditched him. Yeah, like, it is full weird. full-blown ditch. It is weird because they have that whole conversation with him about Adam or whatever. And then they get there and they act like they literally don't know him. And Kaylee's on her phone the whole time. And 
you know, they're just talking to each other, Kaylee and Maddie, and Maddie is clearly wasted. Um, like I think e- w- even more than Kaylee is. Um, yeah, I don't see Kaylee actually being that wasted in that video. I see Maddie super wasted. I don't. I think Kaylee's tipsy, but I honestly don't think she's wasted. Um, that's what sticks out to me the most. And then them ditching him. Yeah. It makes me wonder what was going on. I I agree. It makes me wonder what changed from that conversation to the food truck. Did uh was his response did it throw them off? Did it scare them? Yeah. Like did I they mean, were they talking about that and then he said something back and it threw them off and they're like, "Whoa, can we trust him?" Yeah. Yeah. D- did that conversation go further? Yep. Then we got to see, I mean, off camera probably. where he's like, hey, that's serious. I I don't know what's going on, but you shouldn't have said something. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm making this up. OK, I, I don't know. But we it's don't even know what the conversation was about. Like, we don't know what she told Matt Adam. No idea. No idea. So it's understandable to me why Jack Showalter has so many questions around him. Right. Yeah. Now. One of the details or connections is that Jack Showalter lives in the apartments nearby. And and for anyone watching, a lot of times when we're talking about somebody, um, I don't like to use their last name. And the people that are watching that care enough to know will know the person's last name. But Jack Showalter's name is as known as the victims, literally. It is. As known as the victims. If you go on Google and type in his name, d- endless amount of links and pictures and everything else pop up. So uh, I just want to clarify why I'm openly talking about the name in this way, you know. Um, and uh, so one of the ta- one of the connections we have here is that Jack Showalter lives in the apartments right by and is a direct neighbor. I have not been able to confirm this. I have not seen this anywhere. I don't know why it's they're saying that. Because Jack Showalter is part of the Greek Yeah, life. but he was kicked out of his fraternity. Uh I that's another statement made that I, I personally didn't find any articles or any evidence of that, but I, I'm gonna talk about that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so it's, what I found is er, the earliest mention, uh, at, on 11, 18 of 2022, someone local said anonymously that he was a neighbor of one, one, two, two. Okay. Which is, it's interesting, right? Because then why ditch him if you guys are going to the same place? Right. You know? Huh. Um, here is a clarification for people. So Jack Showalter was not in Sigma Chi. A lot of people think Jack Showalter was part of the, like, 4chan theory Sigma Chi. He is not. He is in uh, Delta Tau Delta. Oh, that's the party Hudson Lindau was in. Yes. That's the party he was at before he died. And that Maddie and the, I mean, the victims went to that party too. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And Delta Tau Delta, United States-based international Greek college fraternity. It was founded in at Bethany College in Bethany, Virginia in 1858, which is a pretty old one. That's a pretty old one. So um, the fraternity currently has around 130 collegiate chapters and colonies nationwide with an estimate of 10,000 undergraduate members. Interesting. I haven't heard much about Delta Tau Delta. Other than Hudson S- Lindau, I haven't either. Yeah, Sigma Chi has been the uh, been the big focus. 
Um, so Jack Showalter was kicked out of his fraternity for bad behavior. So what have you heard? That's literally it. Just that he was kicked out for bad behavior. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We, I've heard all kinds of things. I've heard that, uh, you know, it, we just talked about Brent Kopaka a little bit of, you know, laying the story out there. Um, Jack Showalter is the other one who seems to get connected to the animal mutilations in the area. Yes. Uh, they believe that they, as in the community who, who sees, uh, worth in, this story, these details, and thinks there's a connection to the Idaho Four, believe that uh, Jack Showalter was kicked out of his fraternity for mutilating animals. Yep. So that's what I've heard about it. Um, I can't confirm anything. There are no police reports. Um, but it's interesting. It's interesting because... A lot of people that I've known that are hunters um, actually have a lot of respect for animals. You know, I, I don't know why there's this idea that, like, if you're a hunter, then uh, you automatically are the type of person who wants to abuse and mutilate animals. And those are two very different things, in my opinion. I've, I've personally known a lot of hunters that uh, appreciate and don't take for granted hunting the animal. You know, they use all of it. Um, it's not to intentionally cause harm. They they end the animal's life in a very humane way. The reason why I'm saying that is because I don't think that you can draw a connection between a hunter and a crime is what I'm saying. I get what you're saying, but there are hunters out there that are not what you're saying. <laughs> Sure. And I have, just like there's humans out there yeah. that do that. And too. I ha I have known them, um, you know, people who aren't respectful of animals. But again, like it's kind of a flip of a coin. Like, I don't know if I'd say it's a flip of a coin. I would say it's as, as common as a human that is willing to abuse people. You know, there are good humans and there are bad humans. Yeah. That's why so. I said it's a flip of a coin. Yeah. That percentage is just high. I don't think it's a 50-50 whether you get a bad human or a good human. I do. I don't. I definitely don't. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so Jack Showalter was an acquaintance of the girls at the house. Obviously. I feel like that is blatantly obvious. The conversation they have is very clearly they're on first name basis yeah duh they knew each other <laughs> yeah but not not all of them followed each other on social media though okay so how well did they know each other was it weird to the victims that he was walking with them could the conversation that we saw in the video not be as big of a deal as a lot of people put into it and were they more like, why is this guy walking with us? I mean, it could still be a big deal and them still be like, why is this guy walking with us? Like, they could know. just be talking to each other. Yeah. It depends on what you define you, as a big when deal. When you have serious conversations and personal conversations with people, you're not having those conversations with someone that you wouldn't be comfortable walking with. I mean, they're drunk. I guess. And they're walking. Like, I just Maddie see that was as literally being much less likely Ma than the obvious that they have a personal relationship or. It was to the point of like being kind of sloppy drunk. Yeah. So, I mean, I could see it being brought up, but not going into depth about it. You know, like I told Adam everything like that doesn't tell him what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. But, you you know, in so on some of the social media, though, he appeared in like. Pictures and videos, so I think they knew each other personally. Like, yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he 
may, maybe, I don't know, maybe he didn't use social media much or maybe he felt weird following them because they had boyfriends. And like, I don't know. Yeah. Personal choice for some reason. I don't know. So Jack Showalter, that night, the community believes he uh, immediately after that interaction, he drove to his parents' cabin in uh, Boise or Des Moines. Um, I think it's Boise, right? Yeah, Boise, in Boise. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But I think that could be strange if it's an unplanned trip, right? Because why would you unplan it at 2 a.m., go drive a five-hour drive? Why would he be at a bar and plan to leave right after the bar at 1.30 or 1.45 a.m. to go drive to his parents? None of it makes sense. Yeah. I guess, unless it's planned. What, you plan to go to a bar and then drive to your parents right after I mean, at could. 2 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, you got to remember college time. So college kids go to sleep at like 5 a.m. That's pretty common. That's normally when Greek row shuts down. So like staying up till 4 or 5 a.m. I don't think is that strange. Um. I think what what would make this strange is if it it's unplanned, if that trip is unplanned or not, which the only person that would be able to know that is the person that would be confirming his alibi. Right. So um, I don't know. I haven't been able to confirm that. I would love to know if you guys can confirm that. Um there's also been rumors that he's been kicked out of corner club and he wasn't allowed at corner club for being weird. Um, and all of this stems around that night, the night of the crime. Um, now I okay. haven't heard what they think happened between him and them or why. Um, if you're a local there though, like he was, you would know about the cameras. Those are not hidden cameras. You the know the grub truck cameras? The grub truck and any of the other cameras there. Uh like when they were walking from Corner Club. You would know about these cameras, right? So would you if you're going to commit a crime like this or would this prevent you from committing the crime? Go walk openly with the two people that you're going to commit the crime against. I don't think that's very likely. No, it doesn't seem very likely. It doesn't. It doesn't feel very sneaky. It doesn't feel very weird. The only in interaction that feels really weird to me is the ditching him thing. I don't understand that. Because based either. on everything that we've just covered right now, uh, clearly they have a personal relationship with him. Clearly they knew him. He was in social media videos and pictures with uh, at the house at one one two two. They were they he he has a really close connection with Maddie's boyfriend. Um, <coughs> so why they ditched him, I don't know, and I don't understand that. Uh, it, it clearly, he wasn't expecting them to leave based on him throwing up his hands when they left. Yeah. Um, so that is the one thing that I find really interesting. If some of these details we can get confirmed, that would, uh, be, that would help me out a lot. That would help me out a lot in trying to identify a lot of this, you know, we've been talking about for a while now and, and we're still trying to get it locked down. I want to know when the animal mutilation started and I want to know yep. when the animal mutilations ended. Yes. Okay. Now, a lot of people that have question marks around Jack Showalter, uh, see a rich kid 
from a rich family. Now, everyone knows a lot of rich kids' stories where they didn't grow up with any accountability. And I'm not trying to put all rich people in the box in a box. I'm not trying to go all eat the rich or anything like that. But there's very real examples out there, like the uh what we're gonna be talking about a little bit later, the Shanna Gardner story. Um, where you don't, you grow up with no accountability. You grow up with financial freedom. You don't ever have to worry about anything except making sure you get what you want in life. And those people tend to have a very different view than a lot of people, not always, but sometimes, right? Um, so I think a lot of people look at Jack Showalter and think this is a rich kid from a rich family that knows how to use a knife, that knows how to use a gun. He must always get what he wants. So something must have went wrong that night that caused him to potentially do these murders and then take off to Boise, right? Now, you know what is interesting? Hmm. So his parents are really important doctors, both of them. Make make oh. a ton of money. There are streets named after him. Okay. Wow. One of his family members, uh, I believe, also had a white four-door sedan car that could match in this situation. Now, that doesn't mean it was there. It wasn't his. Okay. Um, but after the crimes, they took off to Africa. South Africa. Is that confirmed? It's confirmed with pictures. The only thing that would change it is if the pictures are dated incorrectly. Okay. So, um, hmm. interesting, right? Yeah, that but is interesting. When we're looking at this crime, I, I go back to the fact that if you were going to commit this crime, you wouldn't willingly put yourself in front of a camera with the victims. Yeah, the, I mean, that seems pretty obvious not to do that. Um, For somebody that had this crime scene so controlled, that feels really obvious to me. But it is also weird. If if he did drive to his parents' cabin that night at like 2 o'clock in the morning and then they all took off to Africa, that's kind of weird. If it wasn't pre-planned, like you said. Um, I have yeah, another theory. What? I told Adam everything. Was that, could that information have been really what got them harmed? Did he hear about this at 8 a.m. in the morning and get scared and take off? Did he feel like he was in trouble? Yeah, I that's that's kind of what I was thinking about before you said that is is that conversation they had on the street. Did that. Like, did that somehow did that scare him? Yeah. And he was like, I got to go. But why would that have scared him? I. What do you mean? We don't know what it is. Exactly. And if. There is information that had a connection to this crime. Whoever did this, I mean, look at Ethan. A man doesn't make you invincible. Right. You know, I don't know. I, I find it very interesting, you guys. Uh, I want to know what you think about it. I'm going to continue looking into this. This is like the the Brent Kopaka. We've never talked about this topic before, okay? Uh, I wanted to lightly dive into it, but I want to give a reminder to everyone. These people that we're talking about in relation to the Idaho 4 case, it is uh, public knowledge. Some of the details are pulled from online with fair use, um, but... If you want us to be able to continue talking about them, you guys have to make sure that you're being respectful and responsible and not bothering these people, not reaching out to them, not interrupting anybody's lives while we dig into this, right? In a situation where maybe we figured out a 
something drew a connection, uh, that information would go to law enforcement and law enforcement would do their job. We just need to make sure that we aren't reaching out to these people and bothering them. Nothing we say and talk about makes somebody guilty. What makes somebody guilty of a crime is them doing that crime and then it being proven, you know, and court. Um, yeah, it just makes me nervous always talking about people in this way. Yeah. Uh, because I have a respect for everybody. But this is public information, and we have a brain, and it is part of the thought riot axiom. So let me know what you guys think. I confirm this message. <laughs> A case that's been breaking all over the news um, for the past couple weeks is the Madeline Soto case out of Florida. I briefly mentioned it last episode. Um, I think at that time she might have still been missing. Um, but some things have transpired. And her kind of stepfather her mom and this man weren't married uh it was her boyfriend but um you know the mom sometimes refers to him as a stepfather and he's been around for some years um has been arrested for basically sexually abusing a child um oh. and it is believed that Ma maddie was that child um, for good reason. Well, yeah. um, her, they didn't mention her name in the document. Um, they, but they did put a birthday that matches her birthday. And what's in that document is absolutely horrible. So I want to give an overview of, of what has transpired in the Madeline Soto case so far. Um, so we can get caught up to speed and then talk about how her mom is now being, you know, looked at like maybe she knew more than she was letting on. Um, and I understand why that question's being asked though. I hope it isn't true. Um, so February 26, Madeline Soto was reported missing around 8 PM after her mom went to pick her up from school and she never came out. She wasn't there. Um, her mom says that she went and drove around, um, thinking that because her mother had like her work was nearby that maybe Maddie like walked to her mom's work or something, uh, Maddie's grandma, um, and went back to the school. The school was closed. Um, so she contacted police. She found out that Madeline had never shown up to school that day. Um, she never even arrived. And the school she was at was Hunter's Creek Middle School. So apparently the mom's boyfriend, he told this, he told this story and so did the mom in interviews online that they took her to school that morning and dropped her off at a church that was kind of a ways away. Like, um, they, yeah, but that's how the mom says it. That's where this weirdness comes into play. The mom says we, but then later says, well, my boyfriend dropped her off at school that morning. Um, and dr apparently Maddie was embarrassed or something of his car. Um, that's what he claimed. And that he dropped her off at a church down the street from her school and that she walked that way. Um, but she didn't, she never arrived at school and her mom acted like this church was very close. Um, you know, I've, from the maps I've seen, it's not that close. Um, it, it really isn't like, I wouldn't feel comfortable dropping a kid off, you know, a couple blocks from school. Like, what's the point of that? Dropping them off blocks away from school. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. How old was Madeline again? Uh, she was 13. She had literally just turned 13. Okay. I mean, I've never had a 13 year old. I, I don't think that I would do that either, but I mean, 13, I guess you're starting to grow up a little bit, but still that's kind of strange. 
you, you, yeah, let me drop you off way away from your school. Yeah, why even entertain, even if that were true, because it's not true. We know that's not true now. Even if it were true that she's embarrassed of your car, why even entertain that? Say, well, this is my car. Get over it. Don't be so shallow. You know? Mm -hmm. It's just a car. So, like, you got to teach your kids values, though none of that is true, you guys. None of that is true. Um, but we'll we'll talk if about the mom that. mom said it, then it sounds like she should be under fire. Yeah. So, um, then the next day, February 27th, the Orange County Sheriff's Office, which this is all taking place in Orange County, Florida, which is like Orlando. Um, they issued a release about her disappearance, though it was not an Amber Alert because they said it didn't meet the requirements. Um, asking for information about her whereabouts. Then, the day after that, February 28th, a big search commenced. Um, everybody started looking for her. The sheriff's office was leading it. Um, Orange County Sheriff off, off, the, 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 Orange County Sheriff John Mina said the de deputies accessed Soto's phone, finding information that indicated she wanted to live in the woods when she turned 13 years old and her birthday was on February 22nd. So she told a friend that when she turned 13, she wanted to go live in the woods. Okay. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the officers like the search started focusing kind of on like wooded areas. Now, Florida is a very dangerous, swampy terrain with alligators and venomous snakes and all kinds of things, you know, tons of mosquitoes and bugs that you don't want to come into contact with. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know why you would go live in the woods in Florida. Uh, there, it's not even really woods. It's just swamp. Yeah. Um, but it's an indicator that there was problems at home, right? Yeah. Uh, but her mom said in interviews that Maddie was super happy after her birthday and loved all her gifts, but her mom wasn't there at her birthday. Her mom had to work. So her boyfriend and all of her mom's family celebrated Maddie's birthday and her mom wasn't there. But when her mom got home that night, Maddie told her all about it and she said she was super happy and Maddie went straight to bed that she didn't even get on her phone or laptop or anything. She went straight to bed um, and she said she went through Maddie's phone and laptop and there was nothing there like she was talking to anybody or planning anything or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so ultimately the search amounted to nothing. Um, but the sheriff's office announced that Stearns, the boyfriend of the mother had been, was the prime suspect and he was arrested because they found disturbing images when they searched his phone. And conveniently, he had accidentally factory reset his phone the day she disappeared. But they recovered all the nastiness on his phone. And in the affidavit, you guys, yep. it's horrible. Which it is... is images of him abusing what seems to be Maddie. Um, and like full, like full on, like full on. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, and it appears it had been going on for multiple years. Really, really, really sad. Um, so, yeah, he was arrested, but he was, even though he's considered the prime suspect, he was never arrested on charges of, like, have, having anything to do with her disappearance. Until they announced, um, 
that they believe she wasn't alive anymore, that they had found video of him dumping her cell phone or not her cell phone, her laptop and backpack in a dumpster Mm. behind the apartment that they lived in and a video of him with her in the car and they believed she wasn't alive anymore. Like in the passenger seat. Right. Dude. Yeah. So even though they still hadn't found her, they said they were confident that she was no longer alive. Um, he had dumped the backpack in the comp- the school laptop in the dumpster at 7.35 a.m. And the times are important because they contradict with the mom's statements. Now, I guess technically, like, it, it just, the timeline seems too tight, but but we'll talk about it. So, the mom claimed she last saw her daughter getting ready for school at 8 a.m. But he was dumping her laptop and backpack in the dumpster at 7.35. So what, you're telling me he was dumping her stuff before he killed her? Yeah, that's strange. That doesn't feel... That doesn't seem right. I I don't know much about this case. as you guys know, I, I don't have very much time lately to, to pay attention to uh, additional cases outside of my obsessing over certain ones. But um, yeah, uh, by everything you've just told me, I already feel like the mother needs to be looked at, period. Already. Yeah, she needs to be investigated for sure. Um, and I feel, I feel kind of bad, but like, because... You immediately want to believe like she's a grieving mother and she cares about her daughter. But when you find out like this abuse has been going on under her roof from her boyfriend for multiple years and he has pictures of it on his phone and you're claiming you saw your daughter that morning getting ready, but he was dumping her laptop and backpack in the dumpster behind your guys's apartment a whole half an hour earlier um, and that we took her to school. But then later you say it was actually him taking her to school, but you were giving this impression that it was both of you Yeah. So this whole time? Human beings tend to exaggerate. There's no way around that. We all do it. Uh, it it's just an outcome of emotion. Um, and in a situation like that, you wouldn't over-exaggerate to try and hide things. You would under-exaggerate. So what I would expect to see is if, you know, in a situation like that, you would be giving earlier times like to make it seem worse right so there's more urgency to find her not not trying to pad yourself because the concern in that statement is on themselves not her daughter so yeah right away the mom needs to be looked into i agree i agree completely Um, And her interview, I'd be really curious to see what you think of her interview. I wanted to play a piece of it um, because I've heard a lot of people watching that interview say she just seems afraid. Like she doesn't seem like she's grieving. Um, And it's hard to judge somebody's grief, you guys. So I don't think you can base it like her, the way she's behaving solely on the way she's acting, the her behavior. Um, I think you have to look at the evidence and this evidence of what she claims versus what the truth, like what objective video evidence says is, is really what makes me question her that much more. The, her interviews were already a little weird. And I honestly just thought, well, this guy could be abusive to her or something. So she could just be going along with the narrative he's told her to say. Yeah. And it could still be the case that, you know, she wants to believe him and this is what he's telling her happened. 
I mean, you that's know? some very extreme, dangerous, toxic it is. codependence that unfortunately still needs to be held accountable. There, Based on those two things, those two times you told me, uh, that's enough for, I think, her to catch charges, in my opinion. Yep. That's mm-hmm. prioritizing him over her. And uh, you were her legal guardian. Uh, I don't care how long the boyfriend's been there. You were her mother. Um, there are certain expectations that come along with that. And I, I, I personally just don't have any... Um, I don't have any gray area or room for understanding in those situations. Sorry. Like yeah. that, that's, that's a good point. That's just part Me of too. being a parent. It is. It is. Um, so her body was finally discovered March 1st, um, on a wooded area off Hickory tree road and Osceola count in Osceola County. Um, then March 2nd, The boyfriend waived his first appearance in court and he refused to appear in court. He refused to cooperate. Okay. He has not been cooperative whatsoever. And (laughs) County Sheriff Marcos Lopez posted a crime scene photo of Maddie on Instagram. Now I know what everyone's thinking right now. What? It's true. Um, He did. However, the post was meant to be about a situation like something they were doing at a senior citizen's home. And he was posting pictures of that on his Instagram. And he accidentally clicked on one of the crime scene. My question is, though, why is he taking pictures of the crime scene with his cell phone? Dude, we've already talked about this with the Idaho 4. There is a... I don't think cops should be allowed to use their personal phones for duty at all. I you should not be taking pictures of evidence or crime scenes or IDs. Or IDs. Yeah. I'm Agreed. sorry. There needs to be a law against it. I don't think it's acceptable. That's people's private confidential information. That's crime scene evidence. You cannot just have it on your personal phone. Yeah, most cops are wearing a police belt where you're carrying like 10 pounds around your waist. What is an extra phone? Come on. Come yeah, on. Yeah. So, I, I mean, th- he apologized and everything. It's being investigated. I just don't think he should have been taking pictures with his personal phone. And I, if that is something that's regularly happening and um, the police force, it needs to stop. It needs to stop. There, it has to be addressed. Like that is not acceptable, because like that accidents happen. Yeah, exactly. I I don't think that cop should be fired or anything. No, but he I didn't do, do it think on he should be held accountable. Those yeah, those are two different things. Accountable Agreed. doesn't necessarily mean you lose everything, but it does mean you made a mistake and you deserve some trouble. Yeah, I absolutely agree. But yeah, so it's being investigated. Um. And they released court records that officially said that, you know, he was accused, the boyfriend was accused of um, sexually abusing Maddie for years. Um, And it was just, they made it official, basically. Um, And they're continuing to investigate her death. Um, And there's really no additional information other than that. Uh, We're pretty much up to date here. what an animal. He is an animal and it's disgusting. And clearly he had something to do with it. I just don't know if the mother does too. Um, one thing that I question big time is why, like school lets out at like 3 p.m. Why did it take her till eight? She said she just drove around to like her mom's work and stuff to see if Maddie was there. You said this is totally not like her and she's never done this before. Dude, if that was totally not like my kid and she's never done this before and, you know, she forgot her cell phone at home that day. Okay, that's another thing is that Maddie didn't take her phone to school, which we know she was already dead now. But the mom was saying, oh, that's that's like Maddie. She has ADD and she forgets things. She's very forgetful. 
that didn't strike her out of the ordinary. Um, supposedly she was also on the spectrum, but then another doctor said that Maddie's not on the spectrum. So she was kind of confused about Maddie's diagnosis with that. She said, but yeah, she had some trauma from abuse. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, she said, but socially Maddie was great, which doesn't really fit autism, but, or the spectrum. Um, but I mean, it strikes me as odd that she, again, the time frame in the morning that she says she saw Maddie eight getting ready for school, but you know, her boyfriend was already dumping Maddie's stuff. And then she doesn't call police until what is that? Five hours, five yeah. hours after she knows her daughter's missing. Yeah. Sounds like a problem to me. Like, what were they doing? I don't know. Just driving around? Like, why not just call police? I agree. And let I them agree. know, like, my daughter's missing. It, it would only take probably, like, 30 minutes of being, like, panicking and then being like, okay, maybe I should call the cops because she doesn't seem to be at any of her friend's house. Like, it takes two seconds to start picking up the phone calling friends and right. then realizing, okay, she's not at any friend's house. I like agree. I 30 mean, minutes tops. My within 30 minutes, I would have called the school and then would have found out. She that talked they to the teacher. Oh, dude, I would have called right away then. There's no excuse. She did call the school right away. And uh, well, yeah, I her mom called 911 school, right away after she never the showed up to school. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Mm hmm. Yeah. Why? Her mom needs to be investigated. I don't yeah. know what other people are saying online. I, I, that doesn't matter to me. The mom needs to be investigated. It makes you wonder, did she know all this time this was going on? I don't know. It's sad. It's sad that uh, for something like this to come out, you know, the child had to lose their life. That's really unfortunate and depressing. It is. It's super depressing, but I just wanted to get your impression of um, her demeanor when she is doing this interview. John, go ahead and, and tell us what's going on with Maddie. Well, um, Monday morning, we took her to school. We dropped her off close to school, across the street from a church, which is very, it's right next to the school. Um, she crossed the street. Um, and walk to school, what we thought walked to school. Um, my boyfriend who drove her to school walk, drove away at that point. Um, it was seen on video footage that she hung out in the parking lot of the church for a few minutes and then got up and walked towards the school. But she never made it from that walk from, and that was around 9 a.m. when she got up. Uh, she never made it to school after that. Um, it's right next to the school. I don't know why she didn't make it. I don't know if something happened on her walk along the way or if she got taken, but she never made it. And that um, was the last anyone seen of her or heard from her? Yes, um, I went to pick her up after school um, and she wasn't there. Um, so I started driving around, trying, maybe thinking she took a walk. Maybe she decided to walk to my mom's office, which is pretty close to the school as well. Drove around and I didn't see anything. I drove back to the school, the school was closed. I emailed one of her teachers. They confirmed that she was absent all day. At that point is when I called 911 because I realized something was truly wrong. Um, Have you heard from like any of her friends? Has she been active on any social media? She hasn't been active on social media. None of her chats, none of her games. Uh, we did contact all her friends. None of them had seen her Monday or heard from her. Um, yeah, there's no update. Uh, and I have to ask this, and I know I, I hate doing it, but is she the type that would run away? Has this happened in the past or anything? Has she ever threatened to run away? Never. She's never, ever mentioned anything like this before, and she's not the type to want to do this. Um, she did accidentally leave her phone on Monday, um, which is kind of normal for her. She's got ADHD and very forgetful. Um, so she left her phone at home, so there's no way to trace her. They tried tracing her school laptop, um, but that's off, so it's not pinging to anything. Jen, what, what is your fear? I know you mentioned she's on games and stuff. Do you think she could have, like, met somebody and tried to meet up with them? From, She's open to us. She's open with us about, you know, if she's got a crush with anyone. And she told us she had a crush on someone at school. Um, and I looked at their messages. Nothing was weird. I looked at all her messages, all her deleted messages. Nothing seemed weird. It didn't seem like she was talking to anyone. Um, so I don't feel like that's the case. I feel like she may have been taken um, because this is not like her at all to just disappear and not tell us, not let us know where she's going or who she's with. Um, yeah. What, what are you getting from law enforcement? I mean, are they actively searching for her? I mean, what, what happens now? I mean, especially that she doesn't have her phone with her. 
Um, so as far as I know, they're conducting a search around the school, behind the school. There's a Shingle Creek. There's a, a wooded path area that you could walk. Uh, it's a hiking path. They are going back there with their canine dogs. Uh, they've taken a piece of her clothing to see if they can trace her scent. Um, they're also taking their own vehicles. I'm not sure what type of vehicles, but they're going into the woods to search for her. Um, but I don't feel like that's going to find anything right now. We've had people all day on that trail sending us photos to see if anything there looks familiar and like her personal belongings and nothing is hers. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure where to go from here. I'm just contacting the news to get the word out, to get some help because I'm desperate. I, I'm a wreck right now. So you think that she's been taken against her will? I do think so. Yes. As a mom, you know, what is your, what's your mother's intuition telling you right now? I'm trying to hope for the best, but I'm just, I'm scared for her. I want her to be okay. I want her to be safe. I don't want, I don't want her to come back harmed. I, I just, I just want her back. Whatever that means. Just, I just want her back. Are you getting any updates from law enforcement? I mean, yes, they're searching that small area, but have they gotten any hits on any scent or anything like that? They haven't let me know anything. They haven't updated me since I spoke to them this morning. I've contacted them to get some information or to give them some leads, but I've heard nothing back. And Jen, there's no way that she just being, you know, a teenager was like, maybe had a fight with you or an argument with you and was like, you know what, I'm going to go hang out at so-and-so's house and teach her a lesson. You know, could that be yeah. a scenario? I don't believe so. We actually haven't gotten into a fight in like a few weeks or arguments or anything like that. If anything, on Sunday, she celebrated her 13th birthday with my entire family and she had the best day. She was so happy. She showed us all her gifts. Um, she was, she's just a happy girl and she showed it on, on Sunday night when she went to bed. She was so happy. So, you know, she had the best day. I just, you know, there was no, there was no moment in that evening from when she got home from the party that she had her phone or had the laptop. She went straight to getting ready and went to bed. So I know she didn't have any conversations with anyone. She didn't make plans with anyone. I didn't, I didn't see any of that. But she yeah. spent the whole Sunday celebrating her 13th birthday. Was her 13th birthday on that Sunday or that was just like the, the time you guys were celebrating? That was the time we were celebrating. Her birthday was on Thursday, the 22nd. Okay, she just so turned 13. But that's just so heartbreaking to be celebrating her 13th birthday. And then the very next day, She's that's gone. the last you, you see it, you've seen it for her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, where, where do you go now? Are you going to go out there and, and search or look or what, what is your, are you sticking by the phone? Are you, you know, what are you doing? I'm staying at home, staying by the phone, hoping she just appears. Um, I know my entire family is out looking. They've all uh, spread a bunch of flyers. They've gone, I've had people contact me that they've gone to the international airport to spread flyers to Amtrak, to Greyhound, just any way that if someone's taken her and they're trying to take her just to show her face, just to make sure, you know, she's not being taken against her will. And you mentioned ADHD. Was there anything else maybe mentally going on or that, that you knew of? Um, she does suffer from anxiety. And once upon a time, she was diagnosed with autism. Uh, we had her re... What's the word? Re-evaluated. Okay. We had her re-evaluated um, a few months ago, actually. And they told us, no, she didn't have autism, but she did have some autistic traits. She did have ADHD, some autistic traits, but not autism. So I'm not sure where to leave with that because one doctor said she did and one doctor saying she doesn't. And I don't know. She's just in the middle, I guess, because she, she does have some tendencies, but socially she's pretty great. So I'm not sure. And with the video that you were able to see whenever your boyfriend dropped her off, where, where was that? What, like, which video? Was that a surveillance camera? It was a surveillance camera from the church, uh, Peace Church, right next to Med uh, Hunters Creek Middle School. And do you have that video? I don't have that. Um, they didn't show me. They wouldn't show me. It was actually, they, they, my sister was the one at location and they were letting her know what they saw on camera. Okay. Uh, they didn't show it to any of us. Got it. Okay. Jen, is there anything else that you'd like to, to add? <sighs> please, 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 if you have any information, contact me, contact law enforcement. Um, any, any information helps. Um, Maddie, if you see this, please come home. Please be safe. I love you very much. If you have my Maddie, please just let her come home. We just want her home. I dropped her off. Everything looked fine when I drove away. So last time we saw her. What were the conversations that you had in the car when you dropped her off? Not much. She was asleep for most of the way. I told her have a good day at school when she got out. I love her. I said, thanks. Love you too. That was it. And so where, where, where do you think she could possibly be? I mean, this isn't, as I was told, this isn't normal behavior. This is not normal behavior. She's not the type that would just run off. We don't know where she could be. We're scared. We just want her home. Are you, in a sense, blaming yourself? It's hard not to. It just keeps coming in waves. This is the reality keeps hitting. We don't know where she is. We don't know if she's safe. We're just scared. We just want her home. Conflicting reports here and there. People say they see this or that. None of it's conclusive and none of it's helpful. We just want a baby girl back. I don't know if you guys found it 
interesting like I did, but uh, to me, both of their emotions come off uh, not sincere. Well, the the boyfriend comes off overly emotional, like he's literally faking it. Not to me. Um, I don't see it. No, he's crying the yeah, whole time. I understand that, but it does not come off as sincere to me. That's what I'm saying. It seems like he's faking the emotion, like yeah. he's he's crying and overdoing it um like significantly um but maybe he's just crying cuz he he knows his life's over I don't know. um but the mom seems like i don't know she just seems so afraid and a lot of the things she said end up not really lining up or sounding quite right after and you know i i feel i feel bad even thinking that way but the thing is is Sometimes moms do look the other way. Sometimes moms get so wrapped up in a toxic relationship, they forget they're a parent. They forget they forget that they care even about their kids sometimes. Yeah, I don't think there's any reason. We don't need to attach a reason why it could happen. But evidence and history proves that it happens. And I think that's why it's important for the police to look into it because there is objective evidence as to why the mom needs to be looked into. Could some of those things that we just looked at be explainable? Sure. Maybe they're explainable. Maybe the mom's just super bad with explanations. Maybe, uh, not this situation, but like other situations, maybe English isn't the first language. Maybe like there's a million reasons why someone could say one thing, but they met another and that doesn't make them guilty. But the mom needs to be investigated heavily into phones, into uh, interviews with the boyfriend, into as much as they can possibly look into as a suspect. That's the only way we're going to know because a, a human being that, that, can allow something like this to happen is not allowed to be out free in, you know, our society. So, and yeah. I think most people would agree with that. Honestly, I bet you anything, the cops are looking into her. Um, there's just enough that doesn't line up. Um, and I think that's fair enough to say, um, but you know, if the cops look into it and decide she knew nothing about it, all right, at least they looked into it, you know? Yeah. I hope she has an explanation, though. Yeah. Because the times, they don't really add up. They really don't. Um, but I want to know what you guys think um, about her interviews and about the information that she gave and how it contradicts with what the evidence actually says. Um, yeah, just what do you think? I... I want full justice for Maddie, even if that means her mom goes down too. Like if her mom had anything to do with it, she has it coming. Yes. All right. So moving on here, uh, on the evening of February 16th, 2022, Jared Brightigan had just dropped off his 10 year old twin son and a daughter at his ex-wife's home in Jacksonville Beach, uh, Florida, was headed back to St. Augustine where he lived with his two-year-old daughter in the car. Well, on the way, he as he was driving, there was a tire in the road. Um, Jared Brightigan stopped, got out of the vehicle to move the tire, which is interesting because I, I personally wouldn't do that, but he did. Okay. Um, had a man approach him and was shot dead multiple shots, uh, while the two year old was in the back seat. Jeez. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. And this case is going on right now. Okay. So let's get into it. Who are we talking about? Um, Jared Brightigan was a, uh, their LDS, 
Okay. And uh, he was going to school. And uh, while while he was in school in, was it Utah? Can you look it up? I don't I don't have it on my my uh, my bullet points here. Where where did Jared Bridegan go to college? Because that's where he met his wife. So I just want to make sure I have that right. Um, but while he was going to school, uh, he met his wife. Okay, his soon to be at the time of this incident, ex-wife. But uh, who that was was Shanna Gardner, all right? Shanna Gardner was uh, a very active woman, Was uh, had a whole bunch of interests in traveling, in expensive tasting things, uh, whatever that means, because I'm talking about everything from food to clothing to travel and uh to be honest based on all accounts and everything i've read um jared bridegan was focused on his school what is it utah okay thought so so utah valley he, university yep he was going to school in utah i just wanted to make sure i had it correct here so jared was going to school in utah where he met Shanna Gardner. They were going to school in the same area. Um, Jared Bridegan wanted to focus on his schooling, but based on everything that we can see, uh, Shanna Gardner didn't want that. She wanted to pursue a relationship with him, and uh, she enticed him by this really expensive lifestyle that she had. So her uh, Shannon Shanna Gardner had parents who were bringing in with their business roughly about a hundred million dollars a year. Well, they had money. Serious now, money. What does that equal to a net at the time of doing this research? Each of her parents is worth about $10 million each. Um, so what that ended up looking like is uh, unfettered access for Shannon or Shanna Gardner um, to their accounts. So while Jared Bridegan was in school, they were traveling the world together. They were eating expensive. They were living an expensive life. And uh, due to their religious beliefs, um, Jared wasn't okay with just a relationship because they aren't allowed to do certain things until they're married. Okay. So with the money, with the school with the wanting to move fast and get to know each other in that way, you know, um, they ended up getting engaged and getting married very quick. Her parents fully supported them. Um, and that lifestyle continued. Essentially what I'm trying to build here is a little bit of a background for Shannon, uh, that, she got anything she wanted, okay? She's driving a Mercedes, never had to work a day in her life, had unfettered access to their accounts. Once they got married, they both got these things, okay? They were both driving Mercedes. Jared was continuing his education. Um, and as a, a graduation gift, once he did graduate, her parents gave him $100,000 and said, start your own business. We got you. No ties to it. Here's a hundred thousand dollars. Bottom a million dollar home. Bottom hundred thousand dollar cars. Gave them whatever they want. Okay, so Shanna's never had to. Never understood what it was like to do it, to lift a finger for anything. Well, things move fast. Things seem to be going good. Um, you know, they didn't have a lot of urgency in getting jobs or anything. Shanna didn't even have any interest in getting a job, but Jared <laughs> himself, uh, you know, he didn't have a lot of urgency in getting a job either. They, they were given roughly $10,000 a month, had no bills. Then that's just to do whatever they wanted. They ended up having kids. Um, and along the way, one of their kids ended up having health problems. And the doctor suggested it was heart problems. They were lung problems. The doctor suggested that you move close to the beach, like 
as close to the beach as you can, because I guess it helps the child with those health problems they were having. And I, I didn't get the details of exactly what that was. I'm not sure. It must be the moisture in the air or something. Um, but they end up moving to Florida, okay? When they moved to Florida, things are going okay. Everything seemed to be okay. Um, Jared was pursuing his own interests and career. He wanted to be able to support himself from everything we can see. He ended up getting hired with Microsoft and moved up the Microsoft ladder very quick. He ended up being an executive level manager within Microsoft, which great, you know. Um, and uh, Shanna started taking her health very seriously, working out a lot, working out multiple times a day. Uh, you know, Jared wanted to support her and bought her a personal um, trainer. Um, well, during Jared's job, he ended up gaining weight, focusing on work, less on himself personally, while she was focusing on herself and not on work, right? Different interests here. So they started... They started having some issues, okay? One thing led to another. She ended up having an affair. She does not admit this to this day, Shanna. Uh, she ended up having an affair with the personal trainer that Jared got her. Uh, Jared got confirmation on the phone with the personal trainer, and that's really where we see everything start to crumble here um, of their life. And it ended up turning into a very serious divorce and custody battle of the children. Um, toxic. Everything I can tell it. It's one of the most toxic custody battles I've ever seen in my life. Um, he threatened. I'm. He said that she was spying on him. Uh, had cameras inserted in his car, uh, in his home, in his phone. Um, he uh, he said that she was intentionally trying to use the judicial system against him, harm him and, and keep the kids away from him. Um, just to give a little bit of the background of the who, what, where, and why, you know, and, um, it wasn't going so good, but all in all, okay. They ended up splitting. They ended up taking care of their own finances. They ended up sharing joint custody with the children. And, um, they ended up going to court for seven years. Jeez. Seven That's years. It's a really long time. Super long time. Like seven years after the custody had been given between them. Every time they went to court, it was more accusations at each other. If this situation wouldn't have happened, I swear they probably would have died 20 years early. Because that's just absurd. Seven years? That's probably hundreds and thousands of dollars down the drain. God, why do people, like, let things get to them? Like, give and take, okay? Well, I... It's so dumb. I think it's the human in us all. I really do. I think certain things can get to you and once they're out of your control, because humans in general like control most of the time, most people do, not all. Um, once it's out of your control, then things start getting to you. I don't know. It's what's best for the kids, not for you. Yeah. Yeah. And that so, was not what was best for the kids, clearly. Yeah. So back to the original situation, right? On February 16th, 2022. Jared had just gotten out of his truck and had been struck by, you know, a hail of bullets. Um, he unfortunately died that night uh, with the two-year-old left in the back seat. A passerby saw what was going on later, uh, called 911, police showed up, you know, they figured things out and immediately went to work. Um, that poor baby. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they had some very quick breaks in the case. And um, within two weeks, they had pictures of a vehicle what, that was known in the area and connected to another crime. They had uh, a, a suspect um, that they believe pulled the trigger. 
um, they arrested this suspect, a, a Henry Tenen, who is 61 years old, all right? And um, started interviewing him, started interviewing him. After a short time, he decided to roll over and tell the truth, work with prosecutors. Okay. And the people he was renting from, who was Shanna Gardner and Mario Fernandez, right? Because Jared and Shanna split some years back. Mm -hmm. and continued court seven years. They both started building their own lives while attacking each other endlessly. Well, Sh Shanna ended up getting married to F Mario Fernandez. Um, was that their, the personal trainer? It was not. Nope. The personal trainer, and I, I mean, I guess I can share it now. The personal trainer said she was crazy, um, and there's evidence being used against her from the personal trainer, but she was with Mario Fernandez. They owned multiple houses. This man, Henry Tenen, was renting from them. They are the owners of this house. Uh, so a direct connection there. Um, Mar uh, Henry started working with the prosecutors and admitted that he was a gun for hire and was hired by Mario Fernandez. Holy cow. Yep. That's once, insane. once Mario Fernandez was arrested and he was arrested as soon as Henry started working with them, she fled to Washington. She got out of there. She moved away, moved back to where her parents are located at. And uh, a couple weeks late, not a couple weeks, it was, uh, I think, six months later, the cops came knocking and arrested her in August of 2022. And she has a lot of money backing her. So there's no telling where this is going to go, but the evidence started coming to the surface once she was arrested. Okay. And the cops, man, there are cases out there where I really feel like the cops did their job. This, this to me feels like one of them. They were on this. They were checking everything. They were checking phones. They were checking cameras. They were talking to eyewitnesses. They were digging into both of their past. They were talking with people that you wouldn't necessarily expect them to talk to, like um, years old uh, personal trainers, like tattoo artists that these people go to, which in my opinion, when I'm looking at this, I'm like, dang, good idea, cops. God, tattoo artists are like, therapist you're on a table being stabbed hundreds yep. of thousands of times people tend to talk to tattoo artists which she frequented normal because she was very interested in her physical health she worked out daily or multiple times a day was tattooed up and everything and frequented this tattoo parlor well cops started talking to everybody and people started talking all the way back from the uh personal trainer that Jared hired and you know he told them the story and let them know that yeah they ended up having an affair uh she never admitted it even though Jared wanted to forgive her and move on uh the personal trainer talked to Jared the personal trainer told the cops that uh yeah I admitted it to him I let him know what happened and everything and and moved on and they started asking about his relationship with Shanna and he was telling him that all Shanna would do even then is complain, complain about how he doesn't take care of himself, complain about uh, how she felt like the uh, marriage was a mistake. She didn't want to be LDS anymore and uh, was complaining that he did a whole bunch of complaints. So they move on to the tattoo artist. Tattoo artist says that she straight up said on multiple different occasions that the first time it came out, she jokingly said, yeah, I wish someone would end him, you know, ha oh ha my ha, gosh. joking, you know, but really, uh, the next time she brought it up, she literally asked the tattoo artist if he knew somebody. What? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Now, you know, fast forward up to this time and police have gotten search warrants for all their phones have found communications between Henry who is 61 and looking at a 15 year sentence, which would probably be his whole life. Yeah, uh, the rest of his life it would be, um, they have, or are in the process of, you know, losing kids. They are currently behind bars right now and they are attacking everything. The state and prosecutors are throwing at them. 
So the most recent hearing was those text messages that the prosecutors got search warrants for the defense team for Mario and Shanna are saying that the prosecutors are playing unfair. They weren't allowed to look at these messages because a, a, a whole bunch of these messages were conversations between them and their attorney. So therefore the whole case must be thrown out and dropped. That just happened the other day. This case is very active and going on right now. I'm very curious to see how this is going to turn out because of how many times we talk about what money can buy you in our judicial system. Yep. Her and her family have an endless amount of money to support her. Yep. Endless amount of money to support her. And and you know that the state is is prosecuting Mario and Shanna together. So they are co co-defendants. Co-defendants. Okay. So their defense attorney attorneys uh, are defending both of them. Working together. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I it's... look at this case and I'm kind of blown away by it because it's so obvious. How can you be so dumb? Yeah, I don't know. It is really obvious. Um. Where's the kids? Um, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I'm assuming with their family. Yeah. Yeah, there was really weird situations with the kids too. You know, when, when he had a funeral, um, when they had the funeral for Jared, um, she didn't take the kids to the funeral. And, you know, there's been back and forth with that too because they each had – in relationship children, out of relationship children, and then she separated, uh, you know, the the kids from each other after this happened. Um, Jeez. But, you know, I didn't want to dig into the kids that much just because I wanted to stay focused on the crime itself because I'm really interested in seeing how this turns out. It, this, if any, situation is going to be a situation at what money can buy you. You know, they're currently right now trying to get the prosecutor thrown out. The prosecutor. Wow. Yeah. Prosecutor thrown out. And in their in their filings, it literally says fired. Um, and their case dropped. And there is very clear evidence that they hired this man who was renting their house to pull the trigger on her ex-husband. Jeez. It's insane. And it is active right now. And we're going to keep watching it because it, it it it's crazy. It is crazy. It is crazy. What a spoiled brat. That's what I'm saying. And that's what I think we've looked at quite a few times in the different cases we've covered is this lack of accountability when growing up in the financial freedom. We're talking about, uh, what's his name? Whatever Rogers. Um, Papa, uh, or not no, Papa Rogers. Not Papa uh, Rogers. Elliot. Elliot Roger. Yeah. Similar situation, right? Who was the other one we just covered recently um, that was like Elliot Roger? Um I'm drawing a blank right now. We just covered it two weeks ago. I can't remember, but can there's either. multiple different situations where there is zero accountability top because all they've ever gotten is what they want because they have total and complete financial freedom with millions and millions and millions of dollars. This is another great example of that. Uh, you know why that can be dangerous and toxic in these situations. She literally thought that she could hire somebody that's renting from them to end her husband, which is the most highly statistical probability of outcome, okay, is a partner of some sort that's connected to them with personal connection like that. Um, after having a seven-year-long tooth-and-nail court battle, like, dude. She's just too rich to think there will ever be accountability. It's so ridiculous that I don't need to see any evidence. Someone could have just been like, hey, let me lay this out for you. So there's this guy and this girl that had a relationship. Then they broke up, uh, had the worst fight ever in court. This man ended up getting shot, you know, cold. And 
my I would have been able to tell you this is who it is right here. This is it. Not yeah. Mario, not the new husband. It's her who got the new husband bought into this plan who then hired this person renting their house to then gun down her ex. Yep. Absolutely. It's a tale old as time, man. It's really sad and really unfortunate because there's a whole bunch of kids involved here like you were asking about. Um, a yeah. whole bunch from both relationships. Now, you have children that don't have a father, uh, a two-year-old that was in the back seat. Okay, that during this his father get shot to death, horrible crime. God. You have uh, Shannon kids with Mario and her ex now that don't have a mother, it's insane or a father figure. Um, it's really, really crappy. Yeah, but it's literally insane. It is. It is, and it's so blatantly obvious. And I hope. I hope our judicial system will look through past this, past the money aspects of it. Yeah. The, I, the I one so, downside yeah. is they're going for death penalty charges. I don't think they should have done that. What? Yeah. How can they do that? I mean. That's going to make them lose. They hired, you know, a killer. I. If you take them out of the equation, none of it would have happened. So whoever should have the harshest charges, I do think it's them and not the trigger puller. Because if you take the trigger puller out of the situation, the situation could still happen. They would have just got somebody else to pull the trigger. But yeah. if you take them out of the situation, this never would have came to fruition, ever. They're the reason. Yeah. But I see what you're saying. I'm curious what you guys think about it. Let me know if you've heard about it. It's active, like I said, right now, and we'll keep watching for it, and we'll continue with the updates. Um, I'm really curious to find out how this is going to turn out. I'm really curious to see what kind of money can buy attorneys and if it can get them off a murder, a hit-for-hire charge, right? Sounds similar to what's-her-face from the... Shiver, Lindsay Shiver? Yep, Lindsay Shiver, right? For the, the Bahama failed thing. Bahama hit attack. Well, this yeah. is not a failed one, unfortunately. Um, with a whole bunch of victims, a whole bunch of kids that are yeah. impacted, and uh, a whole sad. bunch of people's lives from somebody that could have just let go. Yeah, She could have just let go. They were both in different relationships, both different jobs, had financial freedom. They could have let go. Um, really sad, but I'm curious what you think about it, you guys. Let those thoughts riot in the comments below. Okay, so there's been some new filings in the Delphi case um, that I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from them, not all of them, um, like not the entirety of them, um, so we can talk about what's going on. So the defense um, filed an early trial motion. They want the trial to happen within 70 days. Um, so that speed tracks everything. And I'm wondering, is McClelland ready for that? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I bet he is. Um, he's probably panicking. Well, in addition to that, the prosecution filed a third request for Richard Allen's um, mental health records. Which I don't know that they can do that. Because they're not doing an insanity plea or anything. They can't just get access to his health records. Nope. Well, one that is protected. One interesting thing that Bob Mata from the Defense Diaries pointed out was a specific paragraph in this motion where basically McClellan told on himself. Um and what it says here, I'll read this right here. So 
The defense has expressed concerns that Richard Allen is being treated unfairly or is being placed in conditions that resemble a prisoner of war. The state has filed a motion for uh, leave in the past to obtain the record to obtain these records, and the defense objected to said motions. The defense has now filed a verified ex parte motion for hearing on funding for expert services. The defense has now filed a verified ex parte motion for hearing on funding for expert services. Within the motion, the defense asked the court to approve funding for Dr. Polly Westcott, a clinical psychologist and and a confession expert. The defense states the conclusion to be drawn from this is that there is a reasonable basis upon which to inquire into the impact of the accused confinement on his mental state. So, ex parte means, which Bob Mata pointed this out from the defense diaries, as I believe I said before I read that, that that means he shouldn't have his hands on it. He was like, how did Nick McClellan get his hands on this? Like, this is supposed to be between them and the the judge that handles the funding. Like, I don't know if in Delphi uh, or Indiana they're doing it like they're doing in the Idaho 4 case where they have a separate resource judge that is ruling on funding for the defense, which they should. Oh, my gosh. With the way Judge Goal is, they absolutely, I hope yeah. that's how they do it there. Agreed. Um but that means that McClellan shouldn't have anything to do with that at all. Like, guaranteed, the state in Idaho should have nothing to do with the resource judge and the defense's funding on their stuff. Um, and for him to cite it in a document, knowing that he's not supposed to be reading that. And, you know, Bob Mata went as far as to say that it was like, what is that word? It's like a professional lawyer -y word. Like, um, not just unprofessional, but like unethical. Okay. It's like, it's straight up unethical. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not familiar with all the terms, but from what he was saying is like, there is no reason Nick McClellan should have this. And not only should he not have it, but it's unethical for him to be reading it. Yeah. Um, yeah. What? And they cited a defense expert in it too that they plan on using. So I looked up the, you know, expert um, Polly Westcott, and she's exactly what it says. She's just a clinical psychologist. Um, she's been cited in, like, I could find one other case um, where she was working for a defense team of somebody. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't see anything extensive or anything like bad or anything like, and sure. I think the defense is doing what they're ex exactly what they're supposed to be doing. There's nothing wrong with them getting an expert um, to help refute because the state's going to use his confessions against him. And we don't know what's on those confessions. Like I with those onus guards, like that happened when his mental health was at its lowest. Like it was when it was really bad and those, there was all that going on with the onus guards. And, you know, people make the argument a lot. Well, he wasn't being interrogated. He was in prison and talking on the phone to his, his wife. I, you don't know what was going on behind the phone where nobody could see. Yeah, You don't know what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, there's already allegations from another prisoner that those prison, that those prison guards were very abusive. So, I mean, I, and look, look at him, like, look how he was. Yeah. So I don't know that we can just make it black and white. He confessed. That's it. It's over. He's guilty. No. Unless you want to completely ignore evidence, which there is real evidence, those guards were absolutely keeping an eye on him, recording his uh, meetings with his lawyers, which is not right or okay, um, and never taking an eye off of him. And we're Odinists. Yeah. 
gang members. There's objective evidence there. They admitted to it. I know. And another set of lawyers said they experienced the same exact thing. Yeah. There, it, there's something wrong there. 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. Something so wrong. So they need an expert to review and look at the confession. Um, and they're going to be using her as a psychologist and a confession expert. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And Nick McClellan is using that as an argument of they need to give me his mental health records. Mm -mm. Well, I mean, that's just not common at all. HIPAA supersedes all he's of it. not allowed to have them. Yeah. Period. He's not. There isn't a court that can overrule HIPAA. Like, period. So, then... But okay. it does make me wonder when I'm playing the other side of the coin here, like what, what is bad in those mental health records? Because if I was, if I was Richard Allen and my mental health records didn't have anything that could be painted against me, I would probably open them up, but uh, that that's not everyone though. Understand that I'm not trying to suggest his guilt by saying that, but I'm just being giving my personal opinion that I would probably open up. I'd be like, whatever. What do you need me to sign? So I think for one, Nick McClelland would try to show that Richard Allen doesn't have a history of mental illness and try to use the defense's own evidence against them. Um, I think that. Proving and, that he doesn't have a history of mental illness would benefit them. Yeah, but he can spin it in his own way, probably, to be like, see, he was, like, making all of that up. Maybe. He's a sociopath. But he could also be like, I am, I was level-headed and being abused by these, you know, jailer dudes, the Department of Corrections officers. Yeah. So here's my mental health records to prove, like, I don't have nothing to hide. These dudes were literally forcing me. Yeah. That's kind of what I feel like was going on, but we'll see. We'll see. Maybe it I wasn't. I think that's the obvious be connection guilty. people could make um, just because it was so drastic of a physical change with Richard Allen. And then yeah. as soon as the Frank's memorandum came came out, it was so drastic of a healthy return. Like, those dots connect by themselves. Nobody's stretching anything to make it work. Uh, I don't think it was the Frank's memorandum, memorandum. It was as soon as the guards got called out and the judge um, or somebody ordered them to stop. I don't know if Judge Gull actually ordered it. I think she did. Told the warden that it, it had to stop or something. I well, I don't know. I don't My memory's so. I'm failing. I'm pretty sure it's the Frank's memorandum that came out that opened up everything that had to do with that, and then his health started increasing. They got called out. Oh, maybe, maybe. So then McClelland. Essential. Okay, so this is the state's motion to withdraw the motion that was for the health records. He takes it all back. Oh, okay. <laughs> so now comes the state of Indiana by prosecuting attorney Nicholas McClelland um, and asks the court to withdraw the state's motion for leave and court to subpoena third party records filed March 6, 2024. And in support of said motion would state the following. Number one, the state received the verified ex parte motion for hearing on funding for expert services filed by the defense on February 26, 2024. The state's access to said motion was not denied in any way. So was it a, Three, it, was it a play just that, for visibility? I don't know. That the state believed it to be, docu be a document that was filed publicly for... Help? he, Dude... Nicholas McClellan knows what ex parte means. He knows what sealed means. The clerk knows what's sealed and what's not supposed to be sealed. What, like what? Did Nicholas McClellan go to the judge and say, hey, judge, can I have uh, the ex parte motion? And she was like, yeah, here you go, Nicky boy. You know, you're my favorite. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> 
to be honest, probably. Um, um, so number four, the prior ex parte filings by the defense filed on December 8th, 2022, June 6th, 2023, and Ju June 6th, 16th, 2023 were all filed publicly and were all accessible by the state and anyone else involved in the case. Five, that all the prior ex parte motions filed by the defense were captioned like the current ex parte motion that was filed. Six, that the state did not know and had no reason to believe that this filing was private because the state and any other attorney who was on the case had access to the filing. Mm. Well, maybe that's because Judge Gull doesn't keep a very good record. Yeah. Like, that is literally her job, and she's horrible at it. And she's failing miserably. So, maybe that's why. Maybe he genuinely thought he was, was <laughs> right? could have access to it because she just really sucks at keeping records. Yeah. And making sure things that are sealed are supposed to stay sealed and things that aren't. Remain it's, public. It's very possible. It's very possible. Freaking goal. But there you go. There's more evidence that, you know, Judge Goal is tanking. Yeah, he's the blaming the defense. Though. He's blaming the defense, though, saying that they should have filed it appropriately. I'm curious, were all the uh, prior ex parte motions filed publicly or did he just have access to all of them even though he wasn't supposed to? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know I if do. I ever read an ex parte hearing, but now I feel like I feel the need to go back and look. Yeah. Because I don't remember. Like, I have no idea. Um, But yeah, now knowing that the state didn't have access to the filing, they're now withdrawing their motion. So um, was he caught red-handed or does Judge Gold really suck at, you know, maintaining the record? And he got his hands on something he wasn't supposed to unknowingly. Either way, it looks really bad. Yeah, it does. And the defense is on it. Like, to be honest... They're on it. And they're very experienced lawyers. Like, very. Baldwin and, and Rosie are have tried many, many murder cases. Yeah. We, I believe that Nick or Gull made the mistake over Baldwin or Rosie, just to be honest. Yeah, we, we looked into the background of them in a previous video. And, uh, yeah, they are very experienced and actually have... an absolutely flawless record. immaculate history and background with nothing bad ever not a single complaint not a single yep. you know accountability around making a mistake nothing nothing we don't see anything no nothing, nothing. no complaint from anybody from the courts from clients from anybody yep Exactly. It's a spotless Flawless. record. Mm -hmm. um, so then we have, and this was filed by Hennessy, which is, um, I believe, Baldwin's attorney representing him. This is list of additional witnesses and exhibits for contempt hearing. Um, comes now the attorneys Baldwin and Rosie, the Counsel comes now counsel for attorneys Baldwin and Rosie. Oh, okay. Both of them. And notifies the state and the court that in addition to all witnesses and exhibits previously disclosed, he may call the following witnesses and offer the described exhibits. Witnesses. Stephen Wood, Angela Sedlowski, Julie Melvin, Terry Williams, Courtney Parsons and Matt Hoffman. Matt Hoffman is the investigator for Baldwin and Rossi for this case. The others are all YouTubers. Matt Hoffman is a bike rider. Dirt like bikes? No. 
BMX. Bicycles. Okay. Well, that's not relevant, but cool. No. Uh, but from what from what I've heard, these are um, Angela and Julie are from the Unraveling, and I don't know where these other people are from, but apparently they're YouTubers. Really? Yes. These are the witnesses they may be calling. What? Now, exhibits. You got to hear this part. This is the part that, like, whoa, is the exhibits, okay? Number one, communications between Gary Bidet. I think that's how you pronounce the last name. Gary Bidet, a.k.a. Fig or Fig Solves, which is a YouTube channel that heavy, like heavily leans toward Richard Allen's guilt and backs the state and the police um, and even claims that they have connections with the prosecutor and the police um, has literally said it on their channel um, okay. and has worked with them. Okay. So communications between this guy, okay, Greg, IK, Fig Solves, and Prosecutor McClelland. Two, communications from this Greg guy and McClelland. So from Fig Solves to McClelland, and also communications between them, multiple. I don't know why they're citing that twice. Number three, Anthony Greeno's YouTube episode titled Crime Nation, Delphi Murders, Watch and Review. Number four, Rick Snay on True Crime Investigates. Five, Baldwin email to McClelland. Re, Professor Turco report. Number six, uh, Fig solves communications with Angela Zadowski, which Angela Zadowski is from the Unraveling YouTube channel. Uh, Fig solves YouTube episode Delphi investigation. Number eight, Fig solves communications with court. Uh, it says communications re court staff revelations. Don't I'm not quite sure what that means. Number nine. Fig solves communication re disqualification of defense counsel. Which, by the way, I saw somebody say in a comment on Twitter earlier that Fig solves apparently um, said publicly that he knew that Baldwin and Rosie were going to get taken, were going to get disqualified before it ever happened. What? Yeah. Now, I haven't seen that with my own eyes. I just saw somebody talking about it um, in a comment. That sounds uh, problematic. Yeah, but clearly there's some problems here. Like, it, it gets worse, okay? So, the disqualification of the defense counsel. Uh, Ten, documentation of relationship between Fig Solves, Fortson, and Cohen which are the leakers. Fortson is the leaker of the crime scene photos that unalived himself and cohen is mark cohen um that has been in contact with several youtubers actually um who was in contact with fortson and they were leaking this stuff together he cohen reached out to murder sheet gosh yeah what is well apparently fig solves had contact with them this hmm. is hmm. this is madness it's like okay what I'm just going to throw this out there. It's a theory I don't have evidence for, but was McClelland using somebody in YouTube to, to do this, to orchestrate the leak? Cause the leak did not benefit the defense. It didn't yeah, no, it of hurt course it them didn't. tremendously. Yeah, it did. It hurt them tremendously. Really bad. And it's really weird that McClelland has contact with a YouTuber who has contact with the leakers. Like, McClelland shouldn't be talking to YouTubers personally. He should not be doing that. Yeah, something's wrong. Number 11, Fig Solve sending defense work product to McClelland. 
Yeah. Number 12, Fig solves sending information to McClellan. Number 13, Fig solves identifying source in Delphi investigation. Number 14, Fig solves posting, um, re sending information to Nick McClelland. 15, Fig solves posting digging dirt on Baldwin. Number 16, Fig solves posting working with law enforcement and prosecution. <laughs> Number 17, Fig solves email of McClelland asking Fig solves to delete everything. What? The defense has an exhibit, which means they have proof of McClellan sending this guy an email asking him to delete everything. Wow. Yeah. 18. Barbara McDonald on Court TV with leaked investigation information. McClellan emailed to defense. Uh, Professor Turco report. So that's one exhibit. Is Barbara McDonald with leaked information and McClellan's email to the defense about the T Professor Turco report? That I don't know if that's implying he gave Barbara McDonald information or what. 19. Leaked search warrant affidavit prior to unsealing. It's really interesting how <laughs> intertwined prosecutor is with YouTube. It's okay. strange. When you when you see things like this, this immediately makes me go back to our Mason video. Yeah. McClelland was not the prosecutor on the case when this first happened, okay? But I don't think that matters if I'm being completely honest because they it has been said it's really odd that Robert Ives stepped down from being the prosecutor, that it didn't make sense that he stepped down when he did. It also didn't make sense that the judge who was originally assigned to the Delphi case recused themselves. Um, it's odd. And many people have felt that was odd for a long time. So I don't, I don't think it's that far fetched to say people were put in the right places at the right time intentionally i will be excited to see the evidence because yeah i don't think it's that far-fetched and it sounds like if they're bringing it up then they have evidence to back it dude fraternities get you connections get you paid more get you in better positions easier yeah so if you're a well-connected mason in the delphi area Who's to say it wouldn't be it wouldn't be very hard to get you in the prosecutor position? Yeah. Because you can help out your buddies. Yeah. The cops. I don't know. This just seems I I have felt Insane. for a while there's some kind of collusion going on here. There's some kind of corruption. Not sure where it's at yet, but I mean, to be honest, McClelland has always felt very slimy to me. So Sergeant, so number 20, Sergeant Holman communications with Terry Williams and or secret keeper. Is that supposed to be a YouTube channel? I have no clue. Terry Williams and or secret keeper. Number 20, YouTubers Frank Meister and Sleuth Video. YouTube the Inquisitor True Crime claiming leaked communications from Rick Allen. 21, Terry Williams posting about inside information of crime scene and the investigation. 22, October 22, 22, YouTube video of Fig Solves discussing his knowledge of a bullet at the crime scene and knowledge that a gun was found at Rick Allen's house when the information was still under seal and a week before it was unsealed. So when he said he uh, was working with McClellan, sounds like he was telling the truth. Uh, 23, email exchange between Judge Gull and Attorney Rosie, um, accidentally misdirected email. 
24, Baldwin emailed to Judge Gull, uh, 10 9 list and 25 list of media dissemination by state actors 25 julie melvin documents uh 26 youtube video titled a reckoning in carroll county uh they also say and this is the last paragraph potential exhibits on or about february 29th 2024 In March 1st, 2024, the defense received an anonymous call from a woman in Texas claiming to have approximately 240 pages of leaked documents and agreed to provide them. The defense has received only a few of those documents, all of which appear to be available to the public. The defense also discovered information from the prof? prof? Professor? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It just says prof claiming that he had delivered two pounds of documents to the Indiana Attorney General. The defense is continuing to investigate that claim, which may result in additional exhibits. Respectfully submitted, David R. Hennessy. Interesting. Mm-hmm. The Delphi case just doesn't feel real. There's so much madness in it. And I think it's come to the point where we just need to figure out and define like the who, what, where, and why this isn't even happening. Yeah. And I also saw a comment um, that Terry Williams did a ride along with Holman, Sergeant Holman, and he spilled the beans on the crime scene. interesting yeah this case needs to start it does need to start and it's going to i mean 70 days they got to get it going you know yep so i mean we'll see we'll see how this turns out um that document was shocking to me though that mccleland is talking to a youtuber Yeah. Well, we haven't seen actual evidence yet, but it sure seems like the defense feels like they have evidence of it. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't believe they would have submitted that document. However, could it be a play? Anything's possible. But based on what we've seen so far with the Franks memorandum and some of the other uh, arguments that the defense have put forward uh, to support, you know, what whatever they had going on trying to keep themselves on re- uh, on on the case or trying to get goal off yeah. uh they usually have pretty substantial evidence backing what they're uh submitting so i would assume based on the history that we've seen in this case so far that we can expect a similar amount of evidence for this information that we're getting right here which would be interesting and and in my opinion should cause a prosecutor to lose their job. It has nothing to do with McLeland personally, about any personal feelings, about anything to do with, you know, past cases. If a prosecutor is breaking their oath of court and sharing confidential information, private information, gagged information with a media source and a YouTuber of all people, uh, I mean, sorry, dude, there is no space for you in our justice system, in my opinion. But, you know, yeah. I guess we'll see what how this turns the out. The fact that he's violating the gag order intentionally and tr- maybe even possibly trying to make it look like the defense is doing it when he's the one doing it. That's what the implication I'm seeing here, though. Like Brendan said, we don't have all the evidence yet. We have to wait Unfortunately, and Judge Gold denied all cameras. There's not going to be any cameras in any court hearings or the trial. Unless she's kicking off defense attorneys. Unless she is, yep, firing defense attorneys and threatening them. That's the only time she allows cameras in the courtroom. Yeah. Which is very interesting, you guys. She won't allow another camera back in the courtroom. And never allowed them before. Literally, it was only that one single time. Hey, wanted to put a good picture of our boys in blue on that were all sitting there waiting to be (laughs) put on the stand when they were fired. I mean, 
those defense attorneys called I, them out big time. I mean, a lot more than that. Good luck against going going up against them. They seem to know exactly what they're doing and they're very good at it based on all the evidence, right? Not personal feelings, not subjective feeling, but evidence based on their history and the cases they've been involved in and what we're seeing right here. So, Yeah, it does seem like they know exactly what they're doing. Yep. So good luck. Yep. Uh, but I want to know what you guys think about that information. Um, you know, if you are up on, you know, the creators that are in that document and, you know, you want to share with me who they are, please let me know. Cause I don't know all those people. I've I'm never very curious heard of any of them, uh, except for Greeno. Yeah. That's the only person in all of those that I know of. Yeah, I didn't know any of the rest. Um, the unraveling I knew, but I didn't know like their personal names. So, um, but yeah, interesting. Yeah, let me know what you guys think. It's just always more shenanigans in Delphi. All right, you guys, that is it for the show tonight. That is the very end of Thought Riot Podcast, your favorite true crime and criminal culture podcast. My name's Brendan. And I'm Malia. Thanks for being here with us, giving the show, you know, a listen, hopefully a like, hopefully a comment. Yeah, not hopefully. If you're having a good time, make sure you do that because it does so much for the podcast. Um, it does. So please, please, please hit that like button and leave us a comment under our videos. Even if you're just saying hello, it doesn't even have to be about, you know, anything deep. You don't even have to leave a sentence. We have many people that, that leave an uh, emote, you know, every single video. Yeah. Uh, just to show one emote does the same thing as a hundred sentences does. It all does the same, uh, but it helps the video get out there. It helps people know about it. It helps for overall more engagement. Uh, so please hit that like button. Please hit that subscribe button. Hit that notify button. And if you can't rely on YouTube notifications, like sometimes we see, you know, in YouTube, sometimes it makes mistakes, things like that, like anything. Um, you can also join the Discord. Uh, you can also join dis um, Patreon. Patreon. I'm sorry, Patreon, where we have paid tiers and free tiers and free tiers. You will always have a spot for everybody in the free category. So um, do that. And this is episode number what? 34, I think? Yep. 34. It and is. We appreciate all of you. See you next time. See you next time. Out.